Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I will call this City Council meeting to order of the Bloomington City Council. Thank you for joining us both here in the Council Chambers and online. Good to see everyone tonight. We'll start our meeting as we always do. If you would, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, thank you for joining us this evening. Our first item on our agenda is the approval of the agenda. And on our agenda this evening, we've got a couple of introductory items. We are going to meet uh, some new employees, new Bloomington City employees. And uh, item 2.2 will be an update by our public health administrator, Dr. Nick Kelly, who's going to be joining us for the first time in a while. It'll be good to see him again. Our consent business includes 10 items, and Councilmember Coulter, Coulter has our consent business. Under item four, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, we actually have four public hearings this evening. Three of them are, uh, the first one is uh, an ordinance amending a variety of chapters of the city code and a new fee schedule appendix, kind of cleaning up some things. Then we have uh, three public hearings on uh, massage and malt liquor and intoxicating liquor license applications. And then uh, finally, a resolution regarding the sale process for city-owned properties. And once we get into our organizational business, it really is, uh, after we get past item 5.1, which is a, an appointment to our Human Rights Commission, then it becomes almost a, uh, an old-fashioned study session where it's a lot of information headed our way. Item 5.2 is regarded, regarding charitable gambling. Item 5.3 is regarding liquor license legislative update. And then item 5.4 is our THC edibles discussion. And uh, as I said, all of those will be study session items. We'll, we'll be uh, hearing a lot of information from staff and discussing things among uh, the council. And then, of course, we'll wrap up with our city council policy and issue update. Council, so that's our agenda before us this evening. Are there any changes or additions tonight? If not... I would move uh, approval of our agenda. Second. Got a motion and a second by Councilmember Lohman to approve tonight's agenda. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Now that we have an agenda, item two is our introductory items. And the first item under introductory items is item 2.1, our introduction of new employees. I think we have two different groups of uh, new employees that we're going to meet this evening. Let's start with our new firefighters. Chief Uli Seal is here. He's going to kick us off and uh, introduce the new firefighters to us. Good evening. Hi, um, ma Mayor, Council Members. I'm very pleased tonight to introduce um, four, although I know I can count to four and there's only three standing here. I will, uh, I will introduce the fourth one. She fell ill today and couldn't make it tonight. Um, tested negative for COVID though, but she's uh, just not doing too well, so. Um, um, but I'm very pleased to introduce these four new full-time firefighter, fire, uh, fire inspectors um, that um, have all previous experience with us. And I'm just going to give them an opportunity to say a little bit about themselves um, briefly. Um, um, the firefighter that could not be here tonight is Megan Iverson. And she started with Bloomington Fire in June of 2019, right before the pandemic. Um, working out of Station 4. And prior to that, she worked as a, a resident assistant with Founders Ridge and um, then accepted the position here recently with us full time. She's a certified firefighter 2, EMT, apparatus operator, and fire inspector 1. Hello. Good evening. Welcome. Hello. My name's Ron Crook. Um, I've been on uh, Bloomington Fire for six and a half years. Um, lifelong Bloomington resident and uh, look forward to serving the community. Welcome. Glad to have you in this role. Hello. My name is Mamie Ruman. Uh, same, been lifelong Bloomington resident. I've uh, been on Bloomington Fire for uh, four years. Uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, John, James, uh, not from Bloomington, from Egan. Uh, been on since 2019, and uh, yeah, just excited to uh, start this role. Thanks, you. Well, great. Uh, welcome aboard, all of you, officially in your new capacity. I know you've been on board. I, I do have to ask, uh, so when you were in grade school and the question came up, what do you want to be when you grow up, did you, a did you actually say, I want to be a firefighter? Did, did all of sure you do that? Twice, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> 
That's great, um, and that's great you can accomplish that. Now, as a full-time firefighter here in the city of Bloomington, uh, I know if these are four important roles as we, as we continue to move forward and evolve our fire department to, to meet the needs of a city of 90,000 and the needs of 2022. Uh, so we're very glad to have you on board, and, and thank you for being with us tonight. Thanks so much. We also tonight uh, have three new members of our Public Works Department, and Carl Keel, our Public Works Director, is here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Keel. Uh, this evening, I'd like to introduce three new utility operators on our crew. Maybe I'll give you a little background of what utility operators do. So there's kind of two areas that they work. Uh, one is in operating and maintaining our water treatment plant. So these are folks that are responsible for kind of tweaking all the processes, changing the, out the equipment, uh, and all the maintenance associated with our, with our water treatment plant. Uh, very much responsible for kind of the award-winning water that we have. Uh, the second area is our operations and maintenance crew, and these are the folks that take care of our distribution and collection system, uh, both for water, all the water mains and the hydrants. Uh, they're the folks that in the middle of the winter when we have a water main break are the people that actually get down there and, and fix that. Uh, and also taking care of our sanitary sewer collection system, the pipes in our, in, throughout that convey the, water, the wastewater from Bloomington uh, to the Metropolitan Council's treatment system. Um, so again, have a, a couple folks uh, in these areas. The first I'd like to, to introduce is Michael Rasmussen. Uh, Michael is, is here in blue. Blue for water, he works at the water treatment plant. So uh, Michael is uh, not only a new, a new uh, employee with us, but he's also a new resident in, in Bloomington, just moved to Bloomington in June. Uh, he's here with his, his wife and his two dogs. Comes with a great deal of experience in Wisconsin with the Wisconsin National Guard where he worked for 20 years. Uh, outside of work, uh, he enjoys all things outdoors, loves to go fishing whenever possible, uh, also uh, spends time uh, riding his motorcycle and then actually making fishing lures. Uh, Mike. Nice to meet everybody. Look forward to learning and growing in the city here. Well, nice to meet you, Mike. Welcome aboard. Glad Thank you're you. with us. The next two folks are actually part of our operations and maintenance crew. So they're the, the ones that, that work on our distribution and collection systems. And uh, first I'd like to introduce uh, Mario Terrazas. Mario is... Uh, Married, has two kids, uh, comes with us also with a great deal of experience, uh, most recently in the city of Minnetonka. Uh, he also serves as a part-time firefighter in Prairie and as a part of the Air Force Reserve, so a very busy guy. Mario. <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you for the opportunity. Nice to meet you, Mario. Uh, yes, it sounds like you are very busy. You've got a lot going on, so uh, glad to have you on board. Welcome. And last, but certainly not least, is uh, Jonathan Lapine. Uh, Jonathan, uh, or John, goes by John, is, grew up in Minnesota, in kind of the Golden Valley, New Hope area, but for the past eight to nine years has lived in, in Florida. So he's moving back north, uh, where he has worked in the sewer and water industry in, in Florida. So I think uh, you're happy to be back in Minnesota in the summer. And, uh, <laughs> let him say more about that. Good evening, John. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, and I look forward to the, the opportunity with Bloomington. And you know, uh, yeah, just happy to be back. And you know, I think everything's going well. So, thank you. Thank you. Welcome aboard, and and thank you to all three of you because we know here, obviously in Bloomington, with our our world famous water. I mean, that's a, that's an important thing and, and a point of pride that we certainly hang our hat on. And in terms of the, the operations and maintenance, uh, we just have to look to our neighbors to the north to see what happens when you don't have good operations and maintenance and the troubles that they've had, uh, the significant issues. And so it's an often underappreciated kind of thing that you guys do, but we know just how incredibly important it is. And uh, so thank you for that. And thanks for the work that you put in and the work that goes into making sure that our, our infrastructure is in the shape that it needs to be to avoid uh, any kind of issues or any kind of problems. So. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Item 2.2 on our agenda is an update, a uh, public health update. And our public health administrator, Dr. Nick Kelly, is here this evening. As I mentioned earlier, we 
we've gotten used to seeing you, Dr. Kelly, every week, and now it's a bit more spread out, which I'm just fine with, actually. Thank, thanks very much. But uh, now I know that we've got a, another public health issue that we're, there's some concern in, in Minnesota and across the country, and I think you're going to give us an update on that. So good evening. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members, and I, am, uh, I like being here less frequently talking about public health issues, too. So tonight I'm going to update you on a couple of public health issues that are going on. Uh, just for your awareness, make sure that you understand what's going on and the general public's awareness too. I'm going to start off talking about monkeypox tonight. So monkeypox is a, uh, uh, a not common infectious disease spread by, uh, it's a viral infection. It's similar to smallpox from the same family, but it is not smallpox. And so people get very concerned about it initially. Monkeypox is uh, spread, it's from the monkeypox virus. And right now it's spread mostly through direct skin to skin contact. And most of the transmission we're seeing right now is through intimate or sexual contact. It's predominantly impacting men who have sex with men, but it's important to be mindful that anybody that has direct skin to skin contact can contract monkeypox with somebody that has a, uh, an active infection. Monkeypox is painful and it's unpleasant. Uh, in some <clears throat> cohorts, we're seeing up to 30 to 40% of individuals that contract monkeypox needing additional medical support to manage the pain and complications. Prompt action is critical to slowing the spread and individuals isolating from each other uh, when they have a new unusual rash um, is really important. Vaccination is available, testing is available, and treatment is also available. So we have many tools to control this challenge and if you have symptoms such as a new rash, go talk to your healthcare provider. Take care of that. If you are having challenges getting into your healthcare provider and you're here in Hennepin County, I encourage you to call the Red Door Clinic. Um, they have a separate clinic set up just to help manage this situation. 612-543-5555 and select option three and they'll get you taken care of. So this past Thursday, the CDC did a major update for COVID-19, really revamping a lot of the guidance and direction across the country. So they, they made this statement that COVID remains an ongoing public health threat. However, high levels of vaccine and infection-induced immunity and the availability of medical and non-pharmaceutical interventions have substantially reduced the risk of medically significant disease. So that's that acute, you're gonna potentially die directly from COVID we have those tools to prevent that. Transmission of SARS-CoV-2 remains a problem in the country. We're gonna to continue to see that, but we've been able to avoid most of the acute medical challenges. Well, I agree with that. One of the things that we, we miss when we talk purely about the acute part is the long-term components. So we, we're not really focusing on the long COVID issue. The continued health disparities we see and the limited options for individuals that are at high risk. So we have many members of our community that have multiple health conditions that put them at much higher risk than the general public. And they have limited options to manage that in these situations. Because COVID's not gone, we expect to continue to see population level impacts, such as workforce issues, surges in our healthcare systems, challenges of that nature. For context, we have 29 months of data of COVID hospitalizations here in Bloomington. July was the eighth highest hospitalizations we've seen in the last 29 months. 42, or excuse me, 47 of our neighbors, fellow Bloomington residents, were hospitalized for COVID <coughs> in July. Our data is relatively stable at this moderately high level in the community, and it has been that way since May, very similar to the national trends we're seeing. Our work, we're going to continue to help individuals do everything they can to minimize getting COVID, encourage vaccinations, testing, and improvements to ventilation and filtration. And we're working with partners to help overcome those disparities we see in the community. Another thing you're hearing about infectious disease-wise is polio. Um, the Rotarians in the room are perking up. Uh, they're very familiar with polio prevention. We're not used to talking about it here in the U.S. We've seen polio a polio case show up here in the US and New York, and people are starting to talk about polio again. 
Our team has looked back at our vaccination coverage, especially in our child care centers, and we are doing uh, fairly good. Um, we're not urgently concerned about our vaccine coverage, but we have seen it go down. And our team is working on multiple efforts to increase their vaccine coverage in our community. Right now, it's not a concern if something like that showed up here in our community, but we can do better. And just like we can do better with COVID vaccinations, there's some other vaccines that we can work on getting better at, and we're working on doing that. The other thing we're doing is uh, transitioning how we're working. The last few years have been really tough for our team and we launched an interim strategic plan focused on a just recovery for our public health staff and the community we serve. It's got three goals that complement your strategic plan. Our first is grounding, helping our staff in managing change and being comfortable with the reality we're working in. Supporting, a major part of that is understanding our role with our partners and taking care of mental health in our community. And then building, really complements the city strategic plan by really working on how do we strengthen our external relationships. It's very intentional work over the next 18 months for our team to really focus on our future, helping to make sure our work helps us cultivate an enduring and remarkable community where people wanna be. There's a lot going on in our community that affects the health and well-being of everybody. We see the rise in mental health calls, the impact of the last few years have had on well-being, and I urge everyone to think about their neighbors. Think about what you can be doing to be kind while we think about some of these individual behaviors we take to minimize our own risks. Are you making our community better? It's a question I would love our neighbors to think more about. You may be the one that needs help. We all do things or have things we can be doing to make our community better. And I urge you to think about those collective actions, what we can be doing together to make our community better and healthier in the context of the public health issues we're facing so that we really can be that remarkable and enduring community where everyone wants to be. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Council questions? Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for being here, Dr. Kelly. I appreciate it. Um, regarding our, our, just the general trends from a COVID-19 perspective, um, you know, I know that um, historically uh, we've gotten to a point in our society that, um, and maybe this is philosophical in nature, but um, um, we've gotten to a point where, you know, 30,000 or so folks succumb to the influenza virus every year and we kind of live with that. Are we, are we thinking that, um, you know, the current rates of COVID transmission, hospitalization, death, that kind of thing are, we're at that point or are we still like fairly high above that, not that I am grateful, or I'm not necessarily suggesting that's a good thing that we got to a point where we're comfortable with that. I'm just saying, like, have, have, has it has it gotten to that point? I mean, if I do the math based on the New York Times daily statistics, it looks like we're still looking at like 150,000 people dying every year right now. Um, so, what what do you see as that stabilization? Is is there a point where we say COVID is in the same family, in this you know, in the same like transmission? reality that flu is every year. What, where do you think that is? Thank you. Mayor, uh, Council Member D'Alessandro, that is a, is a very good question and I think it, it really does get more into the philosophical side of things. Right now, since May, we've been averaging around 400 deaths a day in the country. Uh, you do the math, that gets you that about 140,000 deaths a year. That puts it in, right in the middle of the top 10 causes of death in the country. We see about 50,000 deaths a year from pneumonia and influenza. So that may change, it may go up a little bit more, it may go down a little bit more, uh, but that is uh, kind of where we're looking at, that it, it is gonna be a leading cause of death, leading cause of hospitalization, and a leading cause of disability for the foreseeable future. Council, additional questions? Council Member Lohman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so uh, to kind of jumping back to the monkeypox, um, so just uh, really just one question about that. You know, I heard, heard some report that there was a uh, doubling every 17 days of that. Is, am, I, am I misinformed on that? Or, or um, And then kind of secondarily, um, as this 
does or does not become more prevalent? Um, and I know you mentioned a few things, uh, but uh, what what can one do to uh, make sure that they're doing everything possible to uh, you know not contract that? And then, is it a, a cause of death if you if you get this? Can you help me understand that if I weigh that against yep. COVID? Dr. Kelly, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Lohman. Uh, good questions. Uh, so the doubling rate is something that we look at a little bit more from just what's going on. We did see some very rapid growth initially. Um, there's some evidence that it slowed a little, uh, but what we're seeing is uh, the networks where we're seeing these cases occur um, are seeing a fair amount of transmission. It's pretty focused right now in, in men who have sex with men population. What we're seeing is there's some transmission outside of that network, but it's very limited. And so general public wise, there's very little um, other than not, uh, if somebody's got a new rash, they need to take care of that. And for the general public, you, you have to have some close skin to skin contact with a rash to get transmission or something that somebody else was using. So the risk to the public is, is pretty low uh, it's not like COVID, it's not like some of these other infections where you're just going to see huge boluses of transmission. It's that close, intimate contact. We have seen a few deaths, uh, but in the context, we have almost 12,000 cases here in the U.S., 72 cases in Minnesota. Um, we've not seen a death here. Um, there's been a, a few globally, uh, but it is uh, not a disease that we look at with a high uh, fatality rate. It's just painful and complicated to manage because it takes uh, two to four weeks for the disease progression to occur and you do not be infectious anymore. Council, anything additional? Well, thank you, Dr. Kelly. Thanks for coming back and, and filling us in on the variety of topics that you brought forward. And uh, thanks also uh, for your comments Echoing what you said, I think, throughout the pandemic, the notion of the importance of being good neighbors and taking care of each other. I think that's that's a message that we just need to keep repeating over and over again. And I appreciate that you brought that forward one more time. So thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Item three on our agenda is our consent business. And Councilmember Coulter has our consent agenda tonight. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. I have hold so far on items 3.4 and 3.5, but now the last call here, I'm not seeing anyone else, uh, in which case I will move items 3.1 through 3.3 and 3.6 through 3.10. Second. Motion by Councilmember Coulter, second by Councilmember Lohman to adopt tonight's consent business as stated. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Councilmember Coulter, item 3.4. These, uh, both of these items were held by Councilmember Lohman. Councilmember Lohman, 3.4. And Mayor, I just uh, wanted to abstain from 3.4. Um, uh, this is um, some work that's being done with the Treasury, which I support in my main job. Now, I know I don't have to do that, but just out of abundance of caution, I want to just uh, be sure to do that. So not holding it for any reason. This is for the resolution authorizing American Rescue Plan expenditures and related to budget adjustments uh, for PMP water utility items, which uh, works with the Treasury. Um, so uh, with that being said, I'll let my, one of my colleagues move that. Uh, Mayor, I can go ahead and make the motion here. Uh, well, I, I'll move to approve the budget adjustment resolution uh, to move $475,000 in the $2550 Federal Relief Grants Fund in order to fund the 2022-102 water utility items. Second. Motion by Councilmember Coulter, second by Councilmember Nelson on item 3.4. Before we get to a vote, I'm going to turn to our staff and ask, uh, are the five votes... Uh, sufficient to pass this. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, you need five votes to pass this item. Very good. Thank you very much. Council, any additional questions? No further discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Council Member Lohman, item 3.5. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, this item is an award of 2022 401, uh, 402 Gerard uh, Lake. 
park parking lot in the Dred Scott Trail Improvement Project. Um, and this is for, um, and I don't have the number here, um, an amount of money that will be spent to uh, to basically resurface uh, a, a lot. And I've, I've been getting um, uh, quite a few emails um, about this uh, where um, some folks are concerned about uh, how we're utilizing those funds in order to uh, pave uh, pave that, and they thought that maybe there was a, a, a higher and better use uh, that the council could uh, consider. And I wanted to see if uh, staff would want to want to comment um, about that. Um, I do know that uh, that this council is working uh, diligently towards uh, creating a natural resources plan, um, and I know that we, um, as as a kind of a matter of of point, we try to to be planful about how we're utilizing uh, city resources and how to best effectively uh, apply those funds uh, uh, on behalf of the of the residents. So I don't know if, if, if staff wanted to comment a little bit more about this. Mr. Keel. Mayor, Councilmember Lohman, maybe a few comments. We'll just note that this improvement is part of our capital improvements for 2022, was identified in the capital improvement program as part of our park improvements. And the funds that are used for this are part of our park improvement funds, which generally come from the sale of uh, charter bonds, uh, either their distribution from the state for our regional park system, uh, or they come from monies that are dedicated as part of park development, uh, park uh, dedication funds. Um, so generally speaking, they are general uh, fund expenditures come from taxes and they are flexible in the way that they can be used. Um, that said, each year uh, our parks department and our park maintenance staff kind of go through a long list of, of items to renovate our parks and to upgrade our, our systems. The Gerard parking lot has been on that list for quite some time. Uh, those of you that are familiar with it, it's a unpaved lot that serves Gerard Park and the trail system that's around it. Uh, it's an area that I know our staff routinely gets calls from people, especially in the winter and the spring, about how difficult it is to park and that people are afraid of getting stuck and they trip and fall and they get muddy uh, in the parking lot. So there is a, definitely a need uh, to make improvements to that. Um, as we put together that list, there's always a balancing that has to occur between the various needs in our system, uh, from paving projects and safety and convenience for people that use them uh, to uh, natural resources types of projects. So our program, if you look at it, has a balance of all those types of activities. Um, that's not to say that natural resources projects aren't very important, they very much are, uh, but also kind of keeping our parking lots and the accessibility and the usability of all our systems is also equally important. So we feel that this is a, a much needed project. Uh, wouldn't want to diminish our need for, for natural resources projects, but this is very much needed. Council Member Lohman. Oh, Mayor, um, I think it was, it was just this last week that we uh, uh, put aside some uh, dollars for natural resources. Was it in the tune of 200? I can't remember the exact amount. Um, $350,000. Yes, thank you, $250,000. Uh, 300, thank you, 300. So, Four? <laughs> Can I have five? <laughs> so we have uh, put aside uh, some funds for natural resources uh, um, in, in, in the plan. And so I appreciate you uh, 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 talking about that. I don't know if any other council members have anything else to say. Um, uh, I certainly have more comments, but I, I, um, I know, Mayor, we've talked about it. So I, I want to just reserve you to be able to make your comments because I thought they were more uh, concise. Uh, well, I, I, I'll ask Council Member D'Alessandro if she wants to chime in. Well, I, so I appreciate that. I, I, um, this is just the award of the actual contract, correct? So we already had the conversation, I think, at council about whether or not we were going to allocate these dollars. I, I remember that because I remember uh, um, asking several questions about how we could use much more permeable surfacing for this activity as opposed to just tarring it over, if you will. Um, so I, I just want to be sure that people are clear that, um, you know, I don't love the fact that we're doing this. And I know that, there, you know, that there's other people that are uncomfortable with it too. But, um, you know, it is also uh, – this is just the award of the actual grant we've already agreed to. So I don't know that there's – taking it back now would be bad, I think, right? Okay, <laughs> just making sure. Okay, thank you, sir. Appreciate the time. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, and so, to your comments, Council Member Loman, you, you said you received a number of emails. I think I, I got four. 
and so about four, not, not even a half dozen. And I appreciate the folks who wrote in regarding this issue and their concerns about it. A couple of things that I do want to point out, though, that, uh, that Mr. Keel brought up, this project is part of the capital improvement plan. And so, I mean, that indicates to me that there's a plan in place and a commitment by, by the council to make sure that we maintain our infrastructure and the, our parks in general, that we've got to put forward the, the, uh, the effort and, and uh, the resources to maintain our infrastructure. And as I said, the fact that it's part of a plan, I think, is an important kind of thing because this wasn't just kind of come up with out of the thin air. This, is, this was a plan and this was after a number of years of uh, perhaps issues and having it on the list for a while because there are limited resources and so we have to queue things up. And so I appreciate that the effort and the thought and the, the planful intent has gone into this. Councilmember, you also brought up the fact that the city is working on a natural resources plan and I think we've said many times that it's in process and that we would like to finish the plan before we start to allocate resources toward that plan because that's a better way of doing things rather than just trying to pick and choose or having a bright shiny object that somebody gloms onto and says we must do this first to have an actual plan in place and to be intentional about it is a much better way of doing that and I think that um, is what uh, that that's why I'm very comfortable with this that we have talked about a, a needed infrastructure improvement for a number of years and now we've got the opportunity to move forward with it. We also have a process in place to determine what are the most important natural resources projects that we could, should take on, whether it's uh, the, the highest need, the best bang for our buck, uh, where we most impact most people or, or most buckthorn, whatever it is, however we put those criteria together, but to do it through that planful process and then be able to allocate the $350,000 that we just talked about a couple of weeks back and additional resources toward that. And so uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable with this. Uh, as I said, I appreciate the folks who have expressed concern, but I think to put it in that context and to think about it a little bit differently rather than just something that uh, uh, is, has been brought up or is an idea or a suggestion, no, I think we, we're better off headed toward working with a plan and working with the resources that we have. So. Council, anything else on this? If not, Mayor, I'd be happy to. Councilmember Loman. Motion. Find my motion sheet here. Mayor, I'll move to accept the bid and award the contract for the 2022 401 402 Gerard Park uh, Lake Park parking lot in Dred Scott Trail Improvement Project to Bidimus Roadways Incorporated. Uh, in the amount specified here. Uh, motion, do we have a second? Second. And a motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin to uh, adopt uh, item 3.5, which is uh, moving forward with the Gerard Lake parking lot and the Dred Scott Trail Improvement Projects. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Thank you, Councilmember Coulter. Thanks, Councilmember Lohman, for your questions. We'll move on to item four on our agenda, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And our first uh, public hearing this evening is an ordinance amending chapters 6, 8, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, and 19 of the city code, as well as the fee schedule appendix. Um, Ms. Economy Scholler, is she, was she bringing this forward? Ms. Mandershaw. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mayor members. Um, this, I believe, is the end of a very long process that we have been going through systematically through the code to transition our uh, fees that are codified, that previously were codified into the text of our ordinances and migrating them over to a fee schedule appendix. Uh, this will not only uh, keep our costs lower, but also um, provide an opportunity for a more systematized review of all of our fees on a more regularized basis. Um, if you recall, when we amend the code, uh, the city code of ordinances, we need to have a public hearing. We need to notice the public hearing, et cetera. So even if we're changing a fee by $1, we would have to spend you know, 40 to $60 to do so. So... Um, the effort here is to save money and to streamline and uh, systematize the process. And I would also like to 
uh, just take a brief moment, and maybe this is why Lori wanted me to do the talking tonight, to thank um, the staff uh, in legal, specifically Maureen O'Brien and uh, Chris Graves, who have worked on this project tirelessly with the assistance of um, Brianna in finance to move this project to the completion. Uh, this is an ordinance and then a summary publication action as well. Thank you, Ms. Mandershine. Um, I see Ms. Economy Scholler is trying to log in here. She's available. Uh, Ms. Economy Scholler, anything to add to Ms. Mandershide's comments? I believe you. Uh, Mayor and Council, the city attorney has addressed um, all of the issues, and uh, finance does want to thank uh, Chris Graves and all of her staff for all the work that they've done on all of the ordinance items to move them to Appendix A. Very good. Council, any questions on this? Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Just to, <clears throat> excuse me, just to clarify, this is not a substantive change. This is simply relocating items that are already existing in city code and moving them to this appendix. Just Mayor members, yes, that is correct. Yep. Yes. Just wanted to make that clear for the yes. public. I, I think that is accurate. I think it's clean up to make things more logical and more efficient for the work that we do. Council, any additional questions? If not, uh, I will open this. This is a public hearing on item 4.1, and item 4.1 is a public hearing amending chapters 6, 8, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, and 19 of the city code and a fee schedule appendix. Is there anyone in the council chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.1? Anyone? Mr. Sable, do we have anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 4.1? Uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, there is no one on the line. Last call for anyone in the chambers? Anyone to speak to item 4.1? I see no one coming forward. Council, I look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion by Council Member D'Alessandro, second by Council Member Martin to close the public hearing on item 4.1 this evening. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Council, do we have any additional questions? Uh, any need for discussion on this? If not, uh, Council Member D'Alessandro. Just one quick question. I had asked earlier uh, today if uh, Section 11 had needed to be updated in any way, and um, I think the comment was that there was. Ms. Mandershine? Uh, yes, Mayor Members, uh, Council Member D'Alessandro gets the gold star for noticing a typo, um, which we have corrected. Thank you very much. D does that mean that the number 11 needs to be added to the motion is the question? No, I believe it was a cross-reference, um, yes, is my you. understanding. Let me just double-check. It's always the cross-references. Oh, the motion, the motion is missing a few chapters. Okay, yes. Um, I, just, I just got word that the motion is missing a few <laughs> chapters. Uh, so, yes, let's add Chapter 11. I have the... Um, So would there be any and additional changes other than adding Chapter 11 to our motion as well? I believe it's just Chapter 11 that needs to get added. Very good. Thank you for catching that, Councilmember D'Alessandro. <laughs> Thank and, you. And would for you that, like would you like to make a motion, motion Councilmember sure, D'Alessandro? Sure, why not? Let's read them all out, shall we? Very good. Uh, so I will make the motion to adopt an ordinance amending Chapters 6, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, and 19 of the City Code and Fee Schedule Appendix. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Martin, to adopt the ordinance amending the chapters as stated and a fee schedule appendix. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Councilmember D'Alessandro. And I will move that we adopt a resolution directing summary publication of an ordinance amending said chapters, including chapter 11 of the city code and fee schedule appendix. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Martin for a summary publication. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. And I will echo uh, my thanks and my appreciation for the staff's work on this. I know this was not a small task. I know this was not a, uh, a limited time task. This has been going on for a while as we've tried to clean this up and to get this done. And uh, a lot of work went into this and uh, appreciate all that went into it. So. Thanks to staff, Lori Economy Shoulder. I think Brianna was involved, and I know the legal staff was as well. So thank you so very much. Moving on to item 4.2 on our agenda. 
uh, public hearing on a new on-sale 3-2 malt liquor license and on-sale wine license application for Kuro Revolving Sushi Bar. Mr. Junker, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, yes, we have uh, Kuro Sushi, Cur Curry Revolving Sushi. A little teaser. You're going to want to watch for this one. Uh, coming soon. Unfortunately, not too soon. I was just out there last Thursday and Surprise, surprise, construction's hung up and things are waiting. So, uh, But I still want to go forward with this tonight. I have it sit on my desk. I'd rather them or wait for them than then wait for us. So um, everything checks out. Just looking for your approval. Council, any questions? Mr. Junker, I'm sure it's in the packet. I don't know if I saw it. What, the address here. Uh, uh, Maybe it's not in the packet. Yeah, 378 North Garden. North Garden, so in the, in the mall. Very good. Yeah, yep, okay. in the mall. No council questions of Mr. Junker? If not, I will open the public hearing on item 4.2. This is a public hearing on a new on-sale 3-2 malt liquor and on-sale wine license for Cura Revolving Sushi Bar. Is anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.2 this evening? Mr. Sable, anyone on the phone? Mr. Mayor and council members, no one on the phone. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.2? Seeing no one coming forward, council, I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion by council member Coulter, second by council member D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 4.2. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Any questions on this council? I do not see any. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. I will move to approve the on-sale 3-2 malt liquor and on-sale wine licenses for uh, Kura, Sushi, Kura Sushi USA, Inc., doing business as Kura Revolving Sushi Bar. Second. Motion by Council Member Coulter, second by Council Member D'Alessandro to approve the on-sale 3-2 malt liquor and on-sale wine license for Kura, Kura Sushi USA, Incorporated. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Item 4.3 is another public hearing. This is for a new on-sale intoxicating liquor license application for Pizza Novara. Mr. Yes. Junker. Mr. Mayor and Council, Pizza Novaro. Uh, again, a little bit of delay going on with construction, but they're going in right next to Hazelwood because they're the same owners. Um, so we know them very well. So this was kind of an easy one. I was looking for your approval. Very good. I was was wondering when they were going to move forward. I was every time I'm out there, I look at the construction going on. Yeah. Council, any questions on this? No questions. I will open the public hearing on item 4.3, which is a new on-sale intoxicating liquor license application for Pizza Navarro. Anyone in the chambers wishing to speak to item 4.3? Mr. Sable, anyone on the phone? Mr. Mayor, council members, no one on the phone. Last call. Anyone on the, in the chambers for item 4.3? No one coming forward. Council, I look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Loman to close the public hearing on item 4.3 this evening. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Any discussion, Council? Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I will move that we approve the on-sale intoxicating liquor license, uh, Nova Pizza LLC, doing business as Nova, or Pizza Navora. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Lohman, to approve the on-sale intoxicating liquor license for Nova Pizza LLC. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Our final public hearing for the evening is item 4.4, which is a public hearing for a new therapeutic massage enterprise license for Laughing Waters Spa, Mr. Junker. Yes, Mr. Mayor and Council, another one that's familiar with us actually. Laughing Waters was licensed with us for maybe a year or two and she had to shutter thanks to COVID. Now she's kind of stepping into the big league. She signed a deal with uh, Radisson Blue to, to run their spa, which was a licensed facility with us again, closed right as COVID started. So, and I guess that's kind of where she got her start, she told me, but yeah, she's uh, signed a deal to take over the spa inside Radisson Blue, so. Um, but again, known to us, licensed with us before, new location, bigger location. Very good. Good to know. Good to hear. Council, any additional questions? No questions, so I will open the public hearing on item 4.4, which is a new therapeutic massage enterprise license for Laughing Waters Spa. Anyone in the chambers wishing to speak to item 4.4? Mr. Sable, anyone on the phone? Mr. Mayor and council members, no one on the phone. Anyone in the chambers wishing to speak to item 4.4? Seeing no one coming forward, Council, I look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. 
Got a motion by Councilmember Loman, a second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 4.4. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 6-0. Councilmember Loman. Mayor, I just, uh, I wonder if they use Minnehaha water there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you got Mayor? the crowd behind you now. <laughs> Mayor, I'll move to approve um, the therapeutic massage enterprise license for Laughing Water Spa LLC. <laughs> Motion by Councilmember Loman, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro for the approval of the therapeutic massage enterprise license for Laughing Water Spa LLC. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Thank you, Mr. Junker. We'll see you again soon, I am sure. Uh, item 4.5 is our last uh, item under item 4, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And this is a resolution. This is a request for an alternate sale process for city-owned Ralph properties. We had this discussion, was it last time or two times ago? I think it was last time. And we asked uh, staff to make a, a slight modification to make it a little more acceptable for the council. And Erica Coleman, our HRA director, is here to, to tell us all about it and lead us to a vote. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, just to briefly recap, this is the request by resolution for an alternative sale process for the five lots that are being released from the right of way acquisition loan fund, acronym for Ralph. And the lots addresses are 8440, 8442, 8446, and 8452 Humboldt Avenue South and 1210 West 82nd Street. The request is that um, by resolution that the city council approve the HRA managing the marketing and sales process that is um, open, open process. And the change is that they would be marketed, excuse me, they would be marketed for resale to an affordable housing based mission organization for the development and sell, subsequent sale of housing with long term affordability restrictions removing the words owner occupied. So council, I think that was our big concern was that we didn't want the language of the resolution to pre uh, to preempt or to, uh, to not allow uh, long-term affordability that may or may not be owner, owner occupied. Uh, so I think the, the discussion we had last week, I think everybody was in favor with this, with this stipulation, wanted to make sure that we had this. Are there any questions, any council, any questions of Ms. Coleman? Council member? Uh, Martin, uh, excuse me, Nelson. Councilmember Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, just a quick clarification um, on this: Would this open it up to just you know basic affordable housing rental? Um, because that was not my intention. It had to have more of a service mission than just being rental affordable housing mm -hmm. or owner occupied. Thank you for the question, Mayor, Councilmember Nelson, Council members. So the change is properties be sold to an affordable housing based mission organization for the development and subsequent sale of housing with long term affordability restrictions. So no. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that and I appreciate that because I, I think you guys were on the right path with the owner occupied. So I think that's a good clarification. Thank you. Council, any questions on this? As I said, this is not a public hearing. This, um, this is a resolution. So I'd look for action on this, Council. I'll make the motion. Council Member D'Alessandro. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm making the motion to approve a resolution relating to the disposal of real property and appointing the Housing and Redevelopment Authority, HRA, in and for the City of Bloomington as the City of Bloomington's agents for the purposes thereof. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Lohman to approve the resolution in item 4.5 relating to the disposal of real property. Any further council discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you much. With that, as we clip right along on this agenda, we will move into our organizational business, and uh, which is item 5. Our first portion of uh, organizational business is item 5.1, which is an appointment to our Human Rights Commission. And I think, Council, uh, we had uh, the vacancy The vacancy occurred due to uh, attendance requirements. I think folks just had trouble getting to the meetings. Uh, so we, we made a couple of appointments in, in March. 
I think we have to replace one of those folks now this evening. And um, we have, I believe, three applications, and uh, we have one opening. So what um, I think Matt said that he gave us all. This is the sheet we were looking for? Perfect. This is the one sheet. Okay. Uh, all voting sheets. Uh, there was, those are our three uh, applicants, uh, Anthony Comer, Annabelle Kornblum, and Ivy McCory, Macquery. And uh, we have to choose one of those three to fill the seat. Councilmember Member Lohman, question? Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, I wanted, wanted to know if all these folks are eligible to continue to serve um, did staff check to see that they, 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 all three of these folks are still living uh, in the community and are willing to serve? Mr. Brillard? Um, I believe Emily Larson may be available for questions. Um, but yes, I believe these three, uh, that's why this list of applicants is shorter than the the field of the pool of applicants in March, where the uh, staff checked with these three and they were still uh, interested. It looks like Emily Larson is available as well. Good evening, Ms. Larson. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, that is correct. The process for appointing for a vacancy involves reaching out to past applicants, and so each of those three individuals indicated that they are still willing to serve and interested and excited to serve. Thank you, and I assume these are also not in any order of priority. Yes, Mayor, Councilmember Lohman, that is correct. Council, any additional questions? If not, why don't we uh, do as we do? We'll do a, a round of voting, see if we get to four. And uh, if we don't, we'll retabulate, and, and maybe if it, folks don't get, or the, the person with the least amount of votes will fall off the list, and then we'll vote again until we do get to four. Mr. Brillard, I don't suppose you've got uh, the list of who is our first voter. We've been, we've been rotating it. Mayor, I apologize. It did not prepare a, a order of voting. We're going to start on the far end then with uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, number three, Mackerty. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I will do number three, Mackerty. Councilmember Nelson. Three, McCory. Three, Sorry, McCory. Councilmember Coulter. Uh, number two, Cornblum. And I will vote as well for, with, for uh, number three, Abby McCory or Macquarie. We'll have to get a clarification on that because with five votes, uh, Ivy is uh, looks like she will be appointed. Council, who would like to make that motion? Councilmember Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I will uh, move that we appoint uh, Ivy McCory. Uh, to a term on the Human Rights Commission from 9-1-22 to 2-29-24. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to appoint Ivy, what are we going to go with, McCory? Let's go with McCory until we get corrected one way or another. And I apologize, Ivy, if we're, we're butchering your name. I really do. Uh, to a term on the Human Rights Commission from 9-1-22 to 2-29-24. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Congratulations, Ivy, and welcome to the Human Rights Commission. Our second item under organizational business is a discussion on charitable gambling, and it's one we kind of kicked off and talked about, uh, I believe, back in May, if I'm not wrong, where we started uh, the discussion about uh, what we might want to see in potential changes to our current charitable gambling uh, operations and, and regulations here in the city of Bloomington. And I know that... Ms. Scapione uh, did a, an, a lot of outreach and talked to a lot of folks about this and is going to bring some uh, items for us to consider. And uh, I do know we've got a lot of folks here who I know are interested in this. And I want to be clear, this is, when we say study meeting, this is basically uh, an information gathering opportunity for the council. There will not be a vote tonight. There, we may give direction as to which way we would like to go, but there's no vote tonight. Uh, if and when this comes before the council again, there will be a public hearing and we'll have plenty of opportunity for anybody who's interested in this topic to be able to speak to the council on it. So with that, 
Our city clerk, Ms. Capiani, good evening, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and City Council, and I should point out that Doug Junker is here as well, our license examiner and deputy city clerk. He is the resident expert in our current gambling regulations and um, a, the historical expert as well, right, in our history of regulations here in the city. So he's here for questions as well um, as we move through the presentation. Next slide, please. So as a reminder, um, kind of how we've gotten to this point, um, in April 25th at that city council meeting, uh, staff provided a fairly brief overview of charitable gambling regulations and a survey we had conducted of 16 other similar um, cities and what their regulations were. Um, in May, we received a request from the Mall of America. Uh, I'm sorry, I should back up. So at that April 25th meeting, um, the city council um, provided some direction on potential changes to our charitable gambling regulations and asked staff to go back and provide additional um, research and outreach to our charitable gam gambling license holders um, and come back at a later meeting to share what we've learned and to share our additional research. So pretty pretty soon after that happened, we received a request um, from the Mall of America to consider a, an ordinance amendment um, to change the regulations at the mall so that um, instead of charitable gambling premise permits being limited to just the fourth floor, um, it could be they could be issued throughout the Mall of America. And so it was fortuitous timing um, as it allowed us to include that request as part of our outreach efforts and gain um, feedback from our licensed organizations on that request as well. Um, so we could bring it kind of back as one package to the city council. So during the summer, we um, conducted outreach to our charitable gambling organizations. Um, we sent letters to all of our licensed organizations, inviting them to an informational meeting. Um, we had five attendees representing two organizations at that meeting. Um, we had a Let's Talk Bloomington page and survey, um, and we received seven responses from five of our 12 um, licensed gambling organizations. And then the letter also invited... Um, licensees to just contact staff directly, right, to get more information and to provide feedback. Um, and I haven't received any direct contacts outside of the, the, two, the meeting in the Let's Talk Bloomington survey. Um, and your council packet included um, information from the survey or the survey results from that Let's Talk Bloomington page. Next slide, please. As a reminder, um, the potential code changes that we're um, looking at today, um, the first three um, are directly from that city council meeting um, back in April. So looking at that 10% contribution fund, um, increasing the trade area requirement, and that residency requirement. And that all came from the council discussion of wanting to ensure that um, charitable gambling um, activities and funds that are raised here stay and are invested within our community. Um, and then we added, right, the expanded eligibility at the Mall of America to the discussion. Um, and then we also had a suggestion from a few license holders about our permit cap. And so we wanted to bring that in front of the council as well. So we'll go into each of those as de in detail, but that's kind of an overview of the, the five issues um, to discuss this evening. We'll move on to that 10% contribution fund. So as a reminder, cities under state law can require organizations contribute up to 10% of their net profits to a fund that the city administers and regulates. And under state law, the city is limited in how it can expend those funds. Um, and we are limited in the same way that a nonprofit charitable gambling organization um, is limited in how they expend their profits. Um, and so this isn't a, a completely comprehensive list. We provided the items that we thought probably most related to our city organization and our activities. So things like um, activities and facilities for youth, um, to 501c3 organizations, um, to scholarship funds, to relieve the effects of poverty, homelessness, and disability, um, for recognition of military service and support of military personnel, um, nutritional programs and food shelves, primarily for persons over 62, um, and then community arts organizations or sponsorship of community arts programs that are free and open to the public. So it kind of gives you a general idea of how that 10% contribution fund could be um, distributed should the city council choose to um, enact one. Next slide, please. 
As a reminder, the 10, uh, 10 of the city, cities that we surveyed had a charitable contribution fund, and the required contributions range from 5 to 10%. So a city can't go higher than 10%, which is why we call it a 10% charitable contribution fund, um, but some cities did choose to have a 5% um, contribution instead of 10. Now, we wanted to come back and be able to provide counsel with a more firm number of what we could expect in Bloomington um, as far as what you know, what 10% of our organization's um, net profits would be. Unfortunately, our current code doesn't require very extensive reporting of the funds that we receive or that our, um, our charitable organizations receive um, because right now we have a trade area requirement and so we require a, a letter from an accountant stating they've met that 30% that requirement. And so we don't have solid numbers from our own charitable organizations to be able to say, well, best guess, this is what we would get here in Bloomington. So I had to look outside of our city and kind of look at our comparable cities um, that have this 10% fund and try to determine um, what, what that average looks like and give you some information on what that range looks like um, to at least provide an idea, right, of where we might be here in Bloomington. And so as you can see, that average contributions um, in 2020 is the most recent data available from the state. Um, the average is about 65,000. And it's a huge range. We have 13,000 to 137,000. Um, it obviously depends on how many organizations you have in your community and then how successful their lawful gambling um, uh, programs are um, within those cities. Um, some policy things for the city council to think about with this 10% contribution fund um, is the city would need to develop a process for distributing those funds. Um, so typically in the ordinance, you develop the fund, right? You, you establish the fund, um, but then most cities have a, a policy in place, right, that talks about how you would actually distribute. Would you receive applications for that? How is that managed? Um, and so that would then, you know, lead to future policy decisions for how um, funds that come in would be would be um, expended. The city has annual reporting requirements, or any city would that has this fund, um, and the fund cannot be used for staff time required to administer the fund. So typically, um, the reporting requirements are quarterly. So you would see staff time on a quarterly basis, probably five six hours. Um, taking it in total, right, taking in the payments, checking their reports. Um, and then you would see, you know, depending on the process that we laid out for administering these funds, you would see staff time for taking applications, potentially vetting those, right, presenting those to council um, or whatever process we would, we would determine or the city council, I should say, would determine for expending those funds. Um, so it a lot of the staff time may depend on what that process would look like for those 10% contributions. Thank you. During our outreach, um, one of the things that we did in our Let's Talk Bloomington survey is we asked, you know, how would this impact your, would this impact your organization and positively or ne negatively? And as you can see with the 10% contribution fund, um, we had one organization that said they had no, it would have no impact. Um, and then we had three each that said some negative impacts or many negative impacts. Um, and what we heard both through the comments on our survey and then in our informational session um, were that the 10% fund, um, the licensees thought would provide less flexibility for them in how they expend the funds in, commun in the community um, and when there might be a need that comes up um, suddenly. Right, it, it takes away the funds they have available to assist someone um, who might might need immediate assistance with housing, or might need immediate help with you know a veteran who might need immediate help with lawn care or home services or something like that. Um, and so that that was a concern for the licensed organizations. Um, some of our licensed organizations also were concerned about a decreased motivation from their volunteers, um, because a lot of the work gets done by volunteers. And so the more money volunteers can raise for their own organization, the more excited they are about doing the work. Um, and so taking you know a portion of that um, and putting it toward a city administrator administrated fund um, made some of the organizations concerned about losing that volunteer interest. Um, there was also concern about potential reduced sales. Um, the feedback was that some pull tab and, and um, lawful gambling customers 
go to a particular place because of the organization that they're supporting. And so there's a concern if some of that fund is not going directly to that organization, it may decrease the sales. And then um, also impacts to local charities that rely on distributions from license holders. So if they have fewer funds to expend, that's less that they can spend within the community at charities that typically respect, um, expect um, some payments and some support from the licensed gambling organizations. The next item um, we looked at was the tr increasing our trade area requirement. So as a reminder, Bloomington requires that 30% of its proceeds are spent in its trade area, which is Bloomington, Edina, Eden Prairie, Richfield, Savage, Burnsville, and Egan. Uh, and that trade area is defined in state law. Um, so we don't have the ability to decrease the size of that trade area, um, but we do have the ability to increase the percentage that's spent within that entire um, trade area. 13 of the cities that we surveyed um, had trade area requirements, and the range was anywhere from 30% to 100% with an average of about 70. For Blooming our Bloomington-specific license premise, again, it's difficult to come up with an exact number because our licensees are required to report whether or not they meet the 30% requirement. They don't have to disclose what their actual percentage is, um, but we did find that quite a few of our licensed organizations did, and so we were able to come up with an estimated trade area expenditure average from 2021, which is about 65%, but the range is really from 30% to 100%. So there are a few of our organizations um, that are well under that 65% and are really close to more of that 30% range. Some comments regarding that increased trade area feedback. Um, you can see one organization said that it would have some positive impacts. There were four that said no impact. Um, we're already spending all of our funds within Bloomington. Um, and then there were a, a couple, a handful that said there were some negative impacts for that trade area requirement. Um, some comments from our licensees, you know, the increasing the trade area could result in um, more donations to our local charities. Um, one, of our one of our licensees um, commented that 35% would be manageable. Um, anything higher that, than that would be difficult for them to meet. Uh, and there was feedback that 100% could create some problems because sometimes there are expenditures that need to be made outside the trade area. Maybe there's a vendor that only provides this particular type of equipment um, that's outside of our trade area, and so it doesn't count toward that, um, that trade area requirement. Um, and so there were some organizations that said 100% might be a little much because it might be hard for us, um, just depending on where our vendors and where the things we're purchasing are located. And then we talked about this tie to the Bloomington community or a residency requirement. Um, and some cities we found have that, eight of the 16, um, had a requirement for some sort of local connection. Um, and that can look different, right, for every city. Usually it was something where they had a headquarters within the city or regular meetings held within the city um, or members that lived and work within the city um, where the, of the charitable gambling organization. So Bloomington does not currently have that residency requirement. Um, seven of our 12 licensed organizations are currently headquartered in Bloomington. Um, and that equates to nine of our 14 licensed locations are run by Bloomington organizations. Next slide. So you can see here our licensees um, found that potentially having a, a residency requirement tied to the Bloomington community um, could have, two of them reported it could have many positive impacts, one, some, um, three of them said there were no impact, and then one had a concern about negative impacts. Um, some comments for this, it could help local organizations grow within their own city um, and may result from in funds staying in Bloomington that might have gone elsewhere. Uh, there was a concern that existing organizations should be grandfathered in, um, so they wouldn't be made ineligible from um, operating in the city. And then um, there was a concern that there could be capacity issues for local, lo local organizations to serve all of the establishments in Bloomington, um, and just making sure that we weren't um, 
that there weren't any restaurants or establishments that would like to have charitable gambling but can't because there aren't there isn't a local establishment that could provide that service if we were to have this residency requirement. And then some background on the expanded charitable gambling at the Mall of America. So currently, um, charitable gambling premise permits are limited to the fourth floor. We do allow raffles in other areas, but those pull tabs and bar bingo, and those are limited to the fourth floor. Um, that was enacted in 1992, and so I did a deep dive into some council minutes um, and found that there were um, concerns about um, potential mess from pull tabs and minors in the vicinity of gambling. And those were the items, those were the reasons cited back in the 1992 minutes for this provision and this limitation to the fourth floor. So the request from the Mall of America is to remove that limitation and to allow premise permits at eligible locations throughout the building. So as a reminder, state law and city ordinance requirements would still apply. Um, it, the establishment would need to be, or the um, licensee would need to be run by a state licensed nonprofit, and eligible locations would have to hold an on-sale liquor license, um, would have to be the license holder's place of regular meeting or place of worship. And those last two, I'm not aware that any of those would apply out at the Mall of America, so it would very likely be that they'd have an on-sale liquor license. Feedback um, from our uh, charitable gambling um, license holders were was kind of mixed. Um, we had uh, three that noted that there were impacts, two that said no changes, and then two that said there were some negative impacts. Um, some of the comments were this could help our lo local organizations grow, provide additional market for them to expand into, um, and provide more opportunities. Um, there was a concern about having too many licensed locations within the city. Um, and then there was a concern about potential for re reduced sales at existing locations if they're now competing with locations within the Mall of America. And then this additional suggestion that came up during our outreach um, and engagement, and that is to increase our location cap. And so currently, licensed organizations can have up to three premise permits in Bloomington. Our license holders um, suggested increasing that cap to four or five. So not a huge in cap increase, but allowing some additional um, capacity for them or additional opportunity for our license holders, um, especially if... Um, if we're going to expand potentially the gambling uh, or the um, premise permits availability at the Mall of America, this would allow our license holders some additional flexibility and additional room to grow within that potentially new market, if you will. Um, they also commented that a lot of other cities have residency requirements, making it hard for our local organizations to go elsewhere. Um, and so increasing that cap would allow more opportunity for our organizations within Bloomington. Uh, but they suggested not completely removing the cap because the cap does prevent one organiza organization from developing a monopoly within a city. And I should mention, state law does not require a license cap, so that's a, that's a city decision as to what that cap might look like um, and how many we would want. So as a summary of some of the feedback that we've received from our license holders, um, we had asked them to rank their preference for those three potential regulation changes related to bringing funds, investing funds into our community and making sure they stay and benefit our community. Um, and the, the most preferred option was requiring a tie to the Bloomington community, um, followed by increasing the trade area requirement and then establishing um, a charitable contribution fund was the least voted for option. Um, so that's that residency requirement was that, was that top, um, top ranked item. Um, again, with the Mall of America, the, the licensees kind of thought, well, that could provide additional opportunities for us, um, or it could pull from existing locations. There was some kind of you know, uncertainty of what that might look like or how that might impact them. Um, and then that suggestion to increase the license cap to allow for more growth. So next steps. Um, 
Staff is looking for um, direction from city council on any potential ordinance changes. If there's you know, additional research or information that we can provide, we can certainly go back and do that. Um, or if we're at the point where council feels like they would like to see some ordinance language, we can start that ordinance amendment process and have public notice and a public hearing. Um, we would suggest that any ordinance changes that we do do coincide with annual reporting requirements. So start at the January, January 1st of um, 2023 or four, just depending on the timing, but that makes reporting a little easier for our licensees. And with that, Doug and I are available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Scipioni, and I apologize for mispronouncing your name earlier. I'm sorry about that. Uh, in particular, thank you for the outreach and the information gathered here. I think it makes it a lot easier to, to understand what the current licensees are thinking, what their preferences would be, and, and gives us the comparison to other cities as well, so I do appreciate that. Uh, and I appreciate the historical look, historical look also, especially back at the Mall of America, uh, this notion of uh, access of gambling to minors. Clearly, they they had never been in a bar in the Brainerd Lakes area which, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it's an entirely different world, apparently. So, uh, Council, questions uh, just in general, and then maybe we can talk the specific five questions that we have. Does anybody have general questions on this? Council Member Coulter, and then Council Member Coulter we'll start with. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just sort of logistically, we have you said a total of 12 licensed organizations. Between the meeting and Let's, Let's Talk Bloomington, how many organizations total have we heard from? Council Member Coulter, I will add in my head very quickly. We, Mayor and Council Member Coulters, we have heard from six total. Okay, okay, thank you. That that was my, uh, that's helpful. And then, I guess to the mayor's point, I I'm just to be clear, the reason that it's in city code that charitable gambling is limited to the fourth floor of the Mall of America was because of mess related to pull tabs and access and minors being around gambling. Mayor and City Council, that's what I found in the minutes. <laughs> okay. I, that, I couldn't tell you anything past no, that, that, those minutes. I mean, it was it was 30 years ago, but that that is just a very, it's a very interesting way to kick off what I what I like to call vice night here at the <laughs> Bloomington City Council. Um, so I, I have some thoughts on the question, but I just wanted to, to clarify that. Thank you. Council, any additional just kind of general questions before we dive into each of these specific questions? All right. Well, then let's dive into the specific questions, if we should. Um, regarding the, um, I have it written here as 10% tax, but that isn't the correct way of putting it, is it? It's uh, the charitable contribution, the 10% charitable contribution. Um, thoughts on that, Council? Uh, Council Member Martin, then Council Member Nelson. Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, that. Uh, the rest of it I'm pretty comfortable with, but that stuck out to me. Uh, well, obviously the causes that we could support with that are admirable. The amount of revenue generated, if we saw a particular area need, we could fund that out of strategic priorities to that amount. And I, for folks that may not be aware of my day job, I'm a fundraiser for the largest uh, food bank in Minnesota. And I, I am not sure how that conversation would go if my donors found out the 10% was going off the top to an admirable cause, but not what they're looking to support. Uh, so that I, I'm just a little uncomfortable with. Councilmember Nelson, and then Councilmember D'Alessandro. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, that one would be a no for me. <laughs> to the point, Councilmember D'Alessandro. I was waiting for the dog portion at the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. Thank you, Mayor. I apologize. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we're going to handle the questions one at a time, so yeah, I would agree. Um, it doesn't seem I think I wrote juice worth the squeeze here and I, you know from my perspective it didn't seem based on the amount of money we would be able to um, potentially collect that it, it it would make sense to do that thank you councilmember Coulter and then councilmember Loman councilmember Coulter thank you Mary the only thing I would add to this is I I think um, generally speaking in addition to what my my colleagues have said the the reason I'm uncomfortable with this is it it feels to me like we're that's a little bit of a, a solution in search of a problem. If we had something perhaps specific that we were looking to fund with something like that, that's a different conversation. Um, but I, you know, I think right now not having anything in particular 
um, that we're looking to do with that fund, it, it doesn't feel like to me that it's so very necessary. That's Member Loman. So I actually have more questions than I do a perspective or point of view, more so to your point, because um, I know you just listed a few items that those dollars could be utilized for. And so I'm curious about um, if that could be used for arts at all. Um, uh, that's one question. Um, and the other one would be, and I, I, I see disability in here and I see military, but could it be used for a veterans memorial at all? And then, uh, or could this be used for a revolving loan for, let's say, housing for, you know, permanent housing? And so I'm, I'm just curious if you could, you know, turn it on and off um, uh, for specific causes. Um, could, could any, any of those three things be funded by, the, by this up to 10%? Uh, well, we can call it a tax on charity is really what it would be. Ms. Capioni. Mayor and City Council, um, arts organizations are, um, community arts organizations are one of the authorized uh, uses. Um, recognition of military service does include um, memorials. Um, and um, as far as a revolving fund, that I think would take more research, but typically these are um, funds coming in and funds going back out, not typically then coming back back in um, from from other organizations. So I, the revolving loan fund might be a little bit trickier <laughs> under statute. Um, there are, you know, there is the ability for relieving the effects of poverty, homelessness, or disability, but I think how you would set that up um, would determine whether or not it would be allowable under state statute. Um, yeah, you know, those are just my my my, my curiosity questions. Uh, you know, certainly there, there's other ways you could you could go down that route, and uh, it's it's not all that easy to get volunteers. So when you tell them that you know you're only going to be able to use 90 percent or 95 percent of it, that might be a huge uh, stumbling block. So uh, just just curious, so how you could utilize that? So thanks. And I just wanted to uh, chime in because uh, Councilmember Carter actually sent an email with just some thoughts. Uh, and she sent it earlier today before the, before the discussion, but just her reading was that she wasn't supportive of the 10% charitable contribution fund. And uh, frankly, neither am I, given the, I, I think juice not worth the squeeze is, is a good way of putting it. I think if the average would be, or the estimate would be around $65,000, I think uh, I would rely more on the charitable organizations or the, the pull tab license holders to get it to charitable organizations rather than the pass through with the, with the city. So. I, I just I don't know that I would be in support of that. So I think you have your answer to your first question there. Thank you. And then as we move on to our second question uh, regarding the trade area requirement, so I have a question with that. Did you say that we have at least one license holder that does not spend up to the 30% in the in the Bloomington area? Mayor and City Council, they all spend at least 30%. They all spend but some, some are right at that 30%. Some are right at 30%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so actually, that the the trade area requirement and then the tie to the Bloomington community, kind of in my mind, go go hand in hand in a lot of ways. I think the whether or not they are a local organization or live here, or work here, or have a business here, or whatever, whatever, wherever they are, I think if if the requirement was that they spend it here, I'm comfortable with it. If they want to be from you know Minneapolis or Richfield or whatever and raise money here, but then to increase the amount that we want to be we want to see spent here. Uh, I know that a number of folks, we, we heard from a number of folks that they're up at 100%. They just spent all their money here in Bloomington. Uh, I would be in favor personally of raising that 30%, whatever that number is. I'm not exactly sure, but I think if the, if the money is coming uh, as a result of your work here in Bloomington, I would like to see a majority of it, a majority of it stay here in Bloomington. Those are my thoughts. Others? Councilmember Nelson? Councilmember Coulter next. Might be lengthier this time, sorry. <laughs> um, I agree with you in terms of how the trade area and the residency uh, sort of interplay with each other. And one of the things that I'd like a little bit more information on, it, to the extent that you know it, the ones that are near or at that 30%, are those also Bloomington based? Are they out of the area based? How, you know, how does that interplay? Because I can see to the flip side of the mayor's comments, a situation in which um, you got a really good uh, Bloomington organization that 
has capacity to help out in a wider area. And I know they don't do pull tabs, but I don't believe it, but an example I would give is rotary. I mean, they obviously do things all over the place. I don't think they rely on pull tabs. They got other funding mechanisms, but a group like that, I know we heard from the Lions, I think similarly with all the good works they're doing, it may be difficult given their focus to spend that here. But if it's the Bloomington Lions, I may be more comfortable with that versus the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Bloomington, metropolitan area lions so i always like to get bloomington into that <laughs> so so is, i mean so i guess i'm agreeing with you i just i'd, I'd need a little bit more information on how those play out because obviously we've got some jefferson groups some kennedy groups you know they're going to be the ones at the 100 percent. they're supporting the kids and the youth programs and stuff like that those are no-brainers those are easy in my mind it's sort of on the tangent I would agree, and I'll get to you in just one second if I could, Council Member. Do, do we have any information, Ms. Scipioni, of the organizations that are being supported outside the trade area? Mayor and Council, we do not have data on what organizations are being supported outside of the trade area. Under our current reporting requirements, licensees must submit a certified letter that um, they are expending at least 30%. Um, within the trade area, and then they must provide a list of those funds that are being spent within the trade area. Um, and depending on just how the accountant put things together, there's either a bit of data or not a lot of detail into those. Um, and so we don't get a picture of where where else things might be expended. Um, I, Mayor and Council, I can answer, uh, provide a little bit more detail about that, um, which organizations are kind of where on the 30%, you know, close to the 30%. Um, and so there are four organizations um, that in 2021 were under 40% of that trade, were reported less than 40% for a trade area expenditure. Um, and of those, one of them was located in Bloomington, and then the remainder were not headquartered in Bloomington. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'm, I am... I, I agree, generally speaking, I think the trade area requirement should be increased. And I'm, I'm kind of of um, two minds of this because part of me says, you know, I, I, I think personally, I, I think a majority is a reason, is a, a, a sort of a bare minimum to my mind. Um, and so maybe we go, you know, slightly above that. Um, but part of me also says, you know, I mean, maybe outside of maybe a little sort of buffer zone to allow for those kinds of expenses that just can't come within Bloomington. You know, if we are, if these, you know, to the mayor's point, if, if these organizations are essentially making their their money off of work that's happening here in Bloomington, I think a significant majority, to my mind, should come back to benefit the community here in Bloomington. Um, I, I guess the, the question I have related to this is to make sure sort of that my understanding is correct, that these, I mean, the, the, this refers to proceeds that that come from Bloomington. So someone buys a pull tab in a Bloomington bar, and those proceeds then have to be spent in that trade area. So, for example, larger organizations like a larger Lions Club or a larger charitable organization would presumably have locations in a variety of, you know, I mean, kind of all over the place, basically. And so would be, I mean, and then each of them would have their own trade area. So if we were to say up our trade area requirement, I mean, that obviously that wouldn't affect their operations in, in other cities. So that's really not a question as I'm, as I'm expressing myself <laughs> now, I'm realizing this. I guess, I mean, what I, what I'm, what I'm getting at is that, you know, our, I mean, the only effect we have is on what happens here in Bloomington, correct? Mayor and City Council, that is correct. The trade area requirement applies to funds from premise permits within Bloomington, not within any licensed organizations, um, operations elsewhere. Yeah, so, yeah, so that, so, you know, organizations will, I mean, presumably have licenses in, mul in large organizations will have licenses in multiple cities and, and have their own trade area requirements in there and so on. So I, you know, I, I'm not necessarily as concerned about organizations like the Rotary and, and um, the Lions, those other sort of larger organizations, because I'm guessing they are sort of, for lack of a better phrase, taken care of. 
um, with their other organizations. So um, I would like to see us up the, the trade area requirement. I think, you know, majority, like I said, is kind of the bare minimum. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I guess I would want to be more, to the, the mayor's point earlier, more thoughtful and, and planful about what that number looks like and what, what is a good number for the community and, and kind of to match our expectations. Because, you know, my recollection is part of the reason we're having this discussion in the first place was we were hearing from charitable organizations um, where sometimes a significant amount of support was not directly benefiting the community. So um, I think that that's just something we need to keep in mind. And then um, the tie to the community, like I, you know, I agree with, with what's been said. That to me just does not seem sort of as critical. Um, I can see some sort of esprit de corps sort of positive benefits, but in terms of the actual operations and the actual funding, um, that that to me doesn't seem like as as critical of a of a discussion. Councilmember D'Alessandro. See if I can be succinct with my comments here. Um, first, I, I can play two. I can play like devil's advocate on both sides of this. On one hand, Bloomington is a very desirable spot for someone anywhere in the state to have a gambling operation even if they choose not to put any of their money here, um, although we do have that requirement, because of the kind of business that we do here. So it makes a lot of sense. And there's a I'm of the mind uh, saying I don't really want to be the guy that says no to charitable work in Minnesota simply because we happen to be where we are located and have the tremendous opportunity we do with our hospitality industries, right? Um for example, the Mall of America, right? Um, so there's that's one mind. The other mind, of course, is you know this is not that difficult. That's it, this is not that different to me than some of what we were looking at from our local opportunity sales tax thoughts, which is lots of people come here to participate in those things, and shouldn't we get extra benefit from that as a result? So uh, I'm in the like 50% camp here right now, just in my own head. I don't have any other things to offer on that front, but it feels like raising it a little bit. In terms of of being here, the only benefit I could see to having a residency requirement is that you end up with uh, either those residents living here and they're con thereby contributing to the community that way, um, or they work here, which means they're employed here, which contributes to the community that way. Um, but it it seems less of an issue uh, to to deal with that. So those are my thoughts. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Loman. Thank you. And then for the, the trade area, we're, we're talking Savage, Richfield, Eden Prairie. So really what we're talking about is if you're expending that 30% within that trade area, right? Or is this specifically to Bloomington? 30? I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. Mayor and Council Member Lohman, yes, you are correct. It's the, it's the trade area, so it's Bloomington and any contiguous city um, where that ex third, currently 30% has to be expended. So it wouldn't necessarily be primarily in, in Bloomington, but it could be, you know, it certainly could be if you, if you did it that way. So I guess the way I look at this mayor and uh, fellow council members is that, um, you know, I, I'd like to see a tie to Bloomington uh, or, you know, if it's 50 or 51%. Um, so I don't know if any cities do that where you say, well, either you've got a tie, you're either headquartered in Bloomington, have meetings in Bloomington, you know, da, 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 uh, or 51%. Um, I'm not sure if you could go about doing it that way, because I mean, I, I wouldn't have any problem with that, you know. But I don't know if that's administratively impossible to keep track of. Do other cities do that, or um, other trade areas? Maybe I should say more more appropriately, um, do they do that? But I'd I'd be interested in something like that, because that that at least then kind of says, hey, you know, you've got a way to kind of work with within that. So, Mayor and City Council, I didn't find any other cities that manage it that way. Um, Peter Zuniga is here um, to kind of speak to whether or not we might be able to, to do something like that in our code. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Zuniga. Mayor and council members. Uh, thank you, Christina. Appreciate that. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. Mayor, Councilmember Lohman, our current reading of state law says that that would not be prohibited. Um, you know, in my research, I couldn't find anything where, um, you know, like Christina said, where other cities did it that way, but also I couldn't find any court cases 
where Minnesota court said that you can't do that. So it's prohibited or, or it's, it's not it's, prohibited. Okay. It's not prohibited. Otherwise you get sued, huh? <laughs> oh, it's allowed, but it's not prohibited. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm Ms. really Shang, can you now. offer some clarity here. Mayor members, I think what Peter is saying, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, uh, but there's no statutory authority that authorizes it, but he could not find any that that prohibited it. Is that accurate? Correct. I think the way the statute's written right now is it's vague of whether it authorizes it, but it clearly doesn't prohibit it. Great. Rule of thumb council, let's stay at a court. Uh, just in general, just a thought. Um, so, so my thought on this, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, I mean, I, I would like to see a, an increase. And I think if we can get a nodding agreement to maybe uh, have, once we, once we bring this back, we can have the discussion of what that increase might be. But uh, to Councilmember Coulter's point, let's not just throw a dart here. Let's kind of put together a, a thoughtful way of doing this. And I think the thing to, to consider here, whether it's Bloomington or the trade area, or I mean, I'm thinking specifically Bloomington, I bet we can go up and down this dais three times, uh, and each of us could mention a nonprofit in Bloomington who over the last couple of years could have used extra funding. And I mean, it's just something to think about in terms of, uh, we gotta be a little selfish here, I think, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So can we give nodding agreement that we would like to see this number increased? And then we can have that discussion as to exactly where that number would be based on your recommendation, if that would be okay. All right, and then for the residency requirement, uh, I, I kind of heard a split, I kind of heard a collective shrug, flank, frankly, on that, that it was kind of, I think as long as the money is spent here, I don't know that there's a, a concern about exactly where they are. Uh, to your point, Councilmember Lohman, you know, whether or not they are here or they, you know, they're headquartered here, uh, I envision a headquarter being a P.O. box somewhere here, and it's, uh, you know, working their way around that. So it's, an, um, so I think we're in agreement that perhaps the residency requirement isn't a deal breaker one way or another. All right, uh, thoughts on expanding eligibility at the Mall of America. Councilmember Nelson. Thanks, Mayor. I have a few questions on this one um, based on what they sent. Um, it looked like there were a few changes and I think I understand, just wanna make sure I clarify. They eliminated the requirement for it to be in an on-sale liquor establishment, but my understanding is that's in a different place in the code. They just referenced that. Is that how that works? This wouldn't allow it anywhere. Like you, they couldn't just set up a pull tab booth in uh, Nickelodeon world or anything, right? For the kids. Mayor and Council Member Nelson, that's correct. Elsewhere in our gambling code, we address which premises are eligible um, and on sale um, alcohol establishments because it may be beer and wine or liquor um, are eligible um, a license holders place of regular meeting or a place of worship. And I don't think those last two apply, so it would just be on sale alcohol. So even though it's removed from this particular section, it still exists elsewhere in our code, and that limitation would still apply. Okay. And then um, second one related to that was they changed um, the casino games, not really related to the poll tabs or that, but they changed the casino games as part of that to allow it um, even without a private event. So, it, I mean, could they set up casino night or how would that work mr. Junker casino night yeah, uh, mr. mayor and council member Nelson uh, casino nights says maybe some of you've had at work where you do the fake casino night highly regulated and under a big magnifying glass by the state so those are only private parties only for um, like you said you maybe have experienced at work not a dollar in sight, just for fun, just to win those prizes on that table over there. So there's nothing we can do to open that up. That is watched heavily by the gambling board. Okay, so and just to clarify, it sounds like what this is doing is just referring to state law that's already regulated. This isn't opening something up, it's just sort of cleaning this statute up with some redundant information in there. So, um, and then just as history for some of the younger people, the. I'm assuming the fourth floor was because that's where all the uh, bars were originally. So maybe some of you never made it there. I may have made it there early. 
Councilmember Lohman and then Councilmember D'Alessandro. Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, maybe I've got up to two questions now. Um, so I, I, hopefully I won't get the lawyers out again here. <laughs> um, so is there anything out there with regards to um, kind of like what the DMV has where you have um, – uh, requirements around geographical locations or limitations. Can 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 you do that? Can you limit? Uh, so, for example, with the mall, could you say we're only going to have so many in, in these geographical locations? Get me nervous over there. <laughs> uh, Mayor and Council, um, Mr. Zunig is welcome to come up and, and correct me, but given that we currently have um, a location limitation in our city code, I would assume if we wanted to change what that location limitation looked like in our code, we would be able to. So if we said we only wanted three permits on the first floor and two on the second. I'm not suggesting this is what we do, but just as an example, um, we already have a, a specific limitation in our code, and I think it would be something similar um, a similar regulation to what we already have kind of on the books as far as just limiting where they're located. Okay, so there is some type of limitation currently right now, so, so there'd the, be... Correct. Oh. So Mayor and Council Member Lohman, currently only um, charitable gambling can only t occur on the fourth floor. So premise permits for things like pull tabs can only be issued for premises on the fourth floor. Um, so the request is to remove that so that it could be issued for premises within the whole building. But you could have it in, in every single uh, location on the fourth floor that has alcohol, right? I mean, on Correct. the fourth floor, right? Correct. So theoretically, on every floor that has a restaurant, you know, with a liquor license, you know, floor four through one, you could have as many as you have liquor licenses. Is that my understanding? And what I guess my question is, is could you do, uh, I guess these are both my questions, this kind of wraps it up here. Uh, um, could you could you limit by location, I, I suppose you, we already did, but could you limit though within that, that area though, how many, you know, could you cap it off and say X amount of licenses in these locations geographically? Mayor and City Council, I believe you could do that. Um, we would just want to make sure it's clear what we're referencing so that it's easy for us to administer and for potential licensees to understand where and where where wouldn't be allowed. And I'm not necessarily advocating for that, Mayor and, and Council. I'm just saying that there was some concern, if I understood it correctly, that, that uh, there were some folks who were concerned about the mall cutting into the rest of the, the market. I don't necessarily see it that way, uh, but uh, wanted to, to at least consider that and see what other, other people thought of that. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, before I get to mine, I, yeah, if, if we wanted to say no more than five premise locations per floor or something, we could have them look at that. As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't bother me to put some kind of restriction on it or limitation. Um, I'm generally in favor of expanding it. Um, you know, there's a philosophical question about why gambling and alcohol always go together, but that's not for us to decide today, um, I think. Um, so um, I, I think it. I would be for this, with make, knowing that you know they can't, they can't. We can't do it the way they wrote it because they were trying to get around some of these state and city law requirements. But I'm assuming we would deal with that, um, you know, when we wrote the ordinance. So, yep. thank you. And and I I think it makes sense also. I'm to, to Councilmember Nelson's part, point. This was when it was the Upper East Side. It was the place to be, and it was. Uh, all, most of the bars and restaurants were concentrated up there, and now they're more spread out throughout the mall. And I think it, I, I don't understand why we would want to do that necessarily. But uh, I am open to the discussion of perhaps limiting the total number within the mall, just given the, um, the possibility of having dozens of places in there, which I don't think makes sense either. So uh, we could talk about that. Councilmember Nelson? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just following up on what you said there, I do think there's an opportunity if we expand it that, you know, a lot of the people that uh, visit the Mall of America aren't from Bloomington. It's, it's an opportunity for us to help get more funds into our charitable organizations within the community from people who are there for entertainment, shopping. You know, they, they've spent all day spending money. They spend some more money at dinner and, and uh, have a little have a good time. And so got a lot of sports activities here that, you know, we utilize that. And I, I don't frankly see that it's going to take away from other locations um i think it's just a wholly different uh target group that's going to come in and, and help out charities here I, I would agree i think if if 
the folks who would potentially spend money at any of the establishments at the mall, I don't think it's either the mall or head over to the Eagles Club or the VFW. I mean, I don't think there's, it's not an either or kind of thing. I think you're right, it's an entirely different audience. So, enough information to make sense of that discussion? Yes, Mayor and City Council. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then the suggestion from license holders to increase the permit cap. Uh, I think that also probably makes sense. I wouldn't go hog wild on this type of thing, but I think maybe to bump it up by, you know, an, an increment of one or two might make sense. Uh, Councilmember Dallas Sounders. I just have Council? a quick question on the history of that, Mr. Mayor. Are you, are you familiar with why it was capped at three to begin with? I, I am not. I bet Mr. Junker has got more or <laughs> not. <laughs> I'm just pretending here. Um, no, it, Again, and as I mentioned, to keep away the monopolies, and and it also comes down to how many can you really cram into a place too. Um, so it so it kind of goes along with a lot of your questions. You know, we kind of have caps. You can only have three per location, um, and and it rarely that we've ever hit that. Um, and then um, the other thing that you guys have hit on too is you keep saying bar bar bar, and when we look at the mall, there's 20 liquor licenses there. We hit the we hit the gambling jackpot. I identified maybe four or five that are really pull tab worthy. <laughs> you know, there's a difference between Crave and Fair on Four, and so um, and Fair on Four is one of the five. So there's really only maybe three or four spots that's really something these guys are looking at trying to get into. So not not really a, a big uh, going to be a big rush there, I perceive. But uh, no, that's uh, that's all I have. <laughs> that's a useful perspective. Thanks, Doug. I appreciate that. Oh. Mr. Junker, Mr. Mayor, may I ask one more question on that? I think I heard you say this. I maybe just make sure I'm clear. Did you say um, three per location, meaning three different pool tab setups within a restaurant? Or yeah. Bar? So in in Lucky Thirteens, yeah, I could have a pool tab. Christina could have a pool tab. Yep. You could have a pool tab, and we're done. Yep. And then I can only have three in the city. Yep. So that's what we're looking at when they come to apply. Okay. So this particular cap question is related to the number in the city. Yeah. Could I have four or five in the city? Okay. We're not going to change the three per location. We're not looking to do that here. Is that correct? Okay. I don't think we have a place big enough to hold more right. than three. No, it would be weird. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think yeah. I'd have it in like my, just yeah. be walking around with a All right bag. Yeah, code. sure. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate it. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just one quick question on this. I don't oppose uh, moving it to four, probably. That it seems reasonable. But if I understood uh, correctly, we have 12 licensees and 14 locations. So one of them has three? And everyone else has one? Mayor and City Council, that is correct. Okay. So it doesn't seem like it's a, an issue. I mean, it sounds like whoever has three wants another location. <laughs> that will I can be. read between the lines. Well could be. Okay. Again, enough information on that one as well? Yes, thank you, Mayor and Council. Council, anything else to talk about or to add on this discussion? It was a good discussion. So next steps are now to bring back, to, to take all what you've heard and to bring back a uh, proposed ordinance, any idea and timeline? Mayor and City Council, it will probably, to meet all the public hearing notification requirements, we're probably looking at, um, what are we in, August already? So um, end of September, beginning of October um, time frame. Very good. All right, so that's when we will look for it next. And uh, for, as I said, for everybody here who is interested in this kind of thing, uh, we'll certainly keep you updated as to where we are and, and what's what the next steps are. And at the next meeting, when we look at this again, there will be an opportunity for public input on this. So thank you much, Ms. Scipioni. We will move on to item 5.3 on our agenda. This, uh, another discussion here, this regarding the liquor licensing legislative update. Mr. Junker. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, Council, as I think was pointed out, gambling goes with liquor. So here we are. <laughs> So um, kind of like our next topic with the THC, the, so another one of those things where the governor signed and it was in effect right away and caught both alcohol enforcement and a lot of the cities on the run trying to figure out. So here are tonight to go through these. Some of these, um, if you're in favor, um, we'll be back with a simple line item strike. It's, it's 
pretty much that simple in the first couple here. So um, as you remember, we passed a few of these a couple of years ago into code and they always talked about small. So the first one is the cocktail rooms. Currently it's just for the small distillery, the micro distillery um, that can have a cocktail room. That's been uh, now allowed to distilleries. So again, a simple strike if you're interested. Um, the next one is the uh, sale of growlers, which was again was just for the small breweries, Nine Mile. Um, it is now breweries, gonna have growlers. Again, if you're interested, simple strike in our, our definition and code there. The next one gets a little, if I may, weird. <laughs> um, so as we just talked about the growler, 64 ounce uh, jug, and if you've been to Nine Mile, that's what they have. And I've talked to Nine Mile, they're interested in this, um, some of the smaller brewers, uh, and I, I'm not a big beer drinker, but again, that's a lot of beer, you pop that top, how quick does it go flat? So the state is now allowing uh, small breweries, still Nine Mile, not the big boys, just Nine Mile, to sell up to 128 ounces in approved containers. So crawlers, which is a large can, um, bottles and regular cans. Why I said this is a little weird is they have an on-sale license. They have an off-sale license to sell the growlers. This is a different off-sale license. <laughs> so what we're looking here is for your, if you're interested, we need to have another license created, and potentially another fee with that, because it's just another piece of paper, another thing I need to file with this, the, the state. And I assume it's because the state's going to be looking at the, the labeling and the canning and how they handle that new product. And again, um, I'm sure a lot of reports go into the state on that off sale, the combined total of all these things and so on and so forth. So, so uh, it's a, a, a second off sale license to small breweries to allow this additional containers. Any questions so far on those three? <laughs> so the next one is actually kind of an easy one. Um, temporary licenses, um, you're allowed up, uh, a temporary license only to nonprofits, churches and nonprofits. Uh, Nativity and Mary pulls a couple of these a year um, and they're only allowed up to 12 days a year. So 12 singles, six doubles or some combination thereof equaling 12 in a year. But they could only have one every 30 one days. And we've bumped up on that before, where when Nativity used to host um, Heritage Days, it was dangerously close to their fall festival. <laughs> and sometimes it fell into that almost 30 days. So very simply, the state took the 30 days out now, makes it a lot cleaner and a lot less headache for us. I don't have to track so much anymore and count. So, um, so again, that is mimicked in our code. So would we like to remove that 30 day um, between uh, temporary licenses. A lot of talk last summer when they started talking about this outstate Minnesota wanted beer at baseball. Um, so how that came together now is a baseball team that's a member of the Minnesota Baseball Association or the concession that contracts with that baseball team. So again, it's a Minnesota Baseball Association team or their concessionaire. In Bloomington, the teams rent their time and space from us. The concessions are leased or contracted through us, us park and rec. So this model doesn't really fit here in Bloomington. Probably good out in Town Ball, outstate Minnesota where they run in the stadium and that's where everybody goes Friday night. But here we have many, many teams renting our fields and uh, the Minnesota Baseball Association team I am aware of bounces back and forth between Haddocks and, and Dread. So um, you've probably heard this one and it did get in, but it doesn't really fit here. So I'm not looking for any changes on that one unless there's something you'd like to push. Um, in the past, we've done some special licensing for RNC Super Bowl. This is similar to that. It's a little bit more uh, logistics that we have to track. I haven't heard of any restaurants or any, any liquor license that have asked me for this yet. So this is a special extension to the on-sale liquor licenses for the World Cup. Um, it really only affects the men's schedule. I've listed the times there. 
And so basically liquor service would start at about four in the morning here, assuming those are on TV. Um, and that starts November 21. Um, so that would allow liquor service starting at, a, sorry, the game started at 4, so liquor service would start at 3.30 a.m. Um, in the past, we've charged about a $200 fee for this additional license. Um, you know, we've put that list together and put it out to dispatch and the street officers to know that they're staying open later. <laughs> this would be opening quite early in the morning. Um, so again, it's, I don't have any guarantees anybody would want this. But if it's something you're interested, we could at least have it ready for them. Um, and like I said, I haven't had any calls on this at all. That's pretty much everything. Let's do this as we did last time. General questions from Mr. Junker, and then uh, uh, Mr. Sable, don't go far with that uh, PowerPoint. We'll double back and just kind of go through all the different issues one by one if we could. Any general questions of Mr. Junker? All right. Mr. Sable, can we jump back to each of the questions here and just kind of talk through those? So the first one, the uh, cocktail room license can now be issued to a distiller. Any thoughts on this? Any approval, objection? I'm seeing nodding and thumbs up. I, yeah, this seems pretty innocuous, doesn't it? All right, next. Yeah, I wish we had a distillery to talk about. I agree. <laughs> um, Big carrot dangling there. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, since we only have a small brewer, perhaps this might in, entice a larger brewer to move into Bloomington. So I, I think I would think this would be a good idea as well. All right, very good. Allowing small brewers to sell up to 128 ounces in approved packages. Councilmember D'Alessandro with a question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, so um, I don't know if I'm reading this correctly, but is the implication of this um, that there's a limit to the amount they can sell? What I mean is, uh, like today, if I went to uh, our friends at Nine Mile and I bought four crowlers, I would certainly be exceeding mm, the 64-ounce yeah. version, right? So yeah. um, does this mean that that in their current format, the maximum has gone from one to two. Is that what we're doing here? Yeah, correct, uh, Mayor and, and Councilmember Del, Del Sandro. Yeah, so that's why it's a little confusing to me why they tried to break off this second off sale. So yeah, it's it's a total now of 128 ounces in any combination. I could buy a six pack. Oh, I'm going to have to get into math if I go down this example. Okay, so I, some I sort of combination. You're, you're okay. Yeah, 96 yeah. ounces but for a six-pack. Yeah, yeah 128, ounces, 128 yeah. total. So, yeah, now you can only have one growler, but now you could get two growlers, a growler, and a couple of crawlers, and so on and so forth. Okay. Per person. Right. Okay. And and this also then opens them up to smaller format cans, for example, like 16-ounce cans or 12-ounce cans. Yeah. So, again, and that's where that sounds really neat, but it's quite an additional cost. So Nine Miles said he already found a portable canning unit that apparently meets the the department of uh, ag um, requirements and everything um but it, the price tag he told me was you know wow okay um mm -hmm. so yeah I'm, but he seems real serious he wants to explore this option so. mm -hmm. okay thanks appreciate it let's remember Loman. i think he answered my question there so it's it's their liquor it's you're not just selling anything out of that no nope. this you okay can only sell the beer that you made okay, yep. Yep. Okay. council member nelson Thanks, Mayor. So maybe I'm probably just confused here, but you can only buy one growler at a time? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> there you go. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so thoughts uh, thoughts on this? I mean, I think it, it, it probably makes sense. And, and again, if it would encourage other small brewers or, or help out Nine Mile as well, I think it's probably worth doing. So I'd give this a thumbs up as well. So... Curious question for you. Do you want to go heavy on a fee on this? Being they already have an off sale. Right. That was going to be my question, yeah. Mr. Mayor. I'm going give you some guidance there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't go crazy on the fee, I don't think. Yeah. So. We can dial yeah. it back, right? Yep. Thank you. Uh, again, this makes sense, and, and I know full well that after serving on the Heritage Days board that we did bump into this a couple of mm -hmm. times trying to work with a nativity, so I think not having to wait 30 days between events. This doesn't change the number of events that they can have. Nope. It just limits the number of time 
the amount of time between the two events. Yeah, just that that I can't think of any other examples other than yeah, like I said, if you wanted a something in the spring, you know how Easter floats around a lot, or one of some other holiday, some other spring festival or fall festival yeah. that ends up at twenty eight days, and then they couldn't do it. Understood. So yeah. Again, I think this probably makes sense. Also, Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The, these are these liquor license requirements are the three two li licenses, or is it could be full on intoxicating liquor licenses? Yeah, as they're, well? they're both. Yeah, we have a three two temp and a full liquor. Temp. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so, with this, does this support um, like a caterer? Totally different. Okay. Yeah, liquor caterers are allowed to go anywhere in the state with their alcohol. So we have we have catered events all the time. Um, we did add into our code because we had some exa examples where a caterer came in and did a full length. Cirque du Soleil was all catered. So we do require a license and a approval and things for those large scale caters. But no, this is a true, um, I try to push people towards caters more so we don't have to do all this. But, um, but yeah, the, the nonprofit wants to pull their own temporary liquor license. They're in these restrictions and they had to wait that 30 days for another one. Makes sense. So again, I think this makes sense if, if not an improvement in agreement. It's, uh, all right. The Baseball Association, I would agree this makes more sense in greater Minnesota and that where it's it's one field, it's kind of the, the focal field with the focus of one thing and, and one team probably. I don't know that this makes sense here in Bloomington personally. And in the search of the Minnesota Baseball Association, yes, I mean, it's the, the bandits. I didn't even realize the, I mean, is that the the younger kids' teams that they want to sell beer at? Or do they do they go up into well, town ball level ages? Oh, well, yeah. So, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, the other loose end on this one is it allowed the team to have, the team or the concessionaire to have a license, and then it opened the door to every event at that ball field. Oh yeah, and I, I the way that was rewarded was uh, we might want to talk more <laughs> about that if we yeah. if we go down this road. So this one doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, Councilmember Coulter. No, I I agree with that. I would just say if that um, keep in touch on this. If it does yeah. for some reason it does become mm -hmm. a thing that that suddenly we're hearing a lot about, <laughs> uh, maybe something worth talking about. But I think at the moment, no, it, yeah. there's no reason to move forward on it. I would agree with that. We're all good with that. And then the, f <laughs> the, the 4 a.m. open time, that's, that would be a challenge. Yeah. Um, barely time to put the chairs on the tables and you got, you got the commitment. But I, we, we, did, we have seen this. I mean, we did extend the hours during the Super Bowl. We did extend the hours in different places as well. This is a limited time, uh, November 21st through mid-December. Um, I think if we offer this as a possibility, I can think of a handful of bars that probably would take this up on this because of the diehard fans who need to make sure that they see their team play. So, Councilmember D'Alessandro? Just a quick question. Are we able to limit it to 7 a.m. as opposed to 4 o'clock in the morning? Like, could we, or is it one of those things where you can, um, be, because I could see, I could see, I mean, I like a Bloody Mary, you know, but that's, I'm not going to have one at 3.30 in the morning, but, you know, I mean, I'm just kind of curious if there's a way for us to compress the timeline there. Could we establish something a little bit more reasonable? My guess is the 4 a.m. start time is because that's when the, the scheduled kickoff times. Well, I, I understood that, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I looked to league. I'm sure we could dial it. You know, we could dial it in all we wanted, but also, you know, you like a Bloody Mary at 7, but are you a soccer fan? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so um Fair, fair uh, enough. I, I, there, I let's th not make this, it this more complicated than you need to be, right? Yep. Sure. I think this works especially for the limited time that we're looking yeah. at here. Everybody okay with that? God love them if they, yeah. you know, if they're that diehard of a fan that you're going to get up at 4 a.m. to watch a game, give them a beer. And the and the staff time and everything, the two hundred dollars. You can see it's limited to two fifty, but our two hundred dollar history is fine yep. with everybody. Okay. Yep. All right. Is there anything else on this one, Mr. Bajunker? No, on to our next vice. Very good. <laughs> yes, two or three vices down now. We'll, 
We'll call item 5.4, which is a THC edibles discussion. And I think we get everybody back for this one. Uh, Ms. Scipioni, I think uh, Dr. Kelly's coming back. I know that Doug, Mr. Junker is going to chime in as well. That's right. It's a party. Good evening, Mayor and Council, again. Uh, <laughs> um, myself, Nick Kelly, Doug Junker are here today to talk about um, the recent THC edible um, legislation and, um, and potential regulation of those retail sales within the city of Bloomington. So I'm going to kick it off to Mr. Kelly to get us started. So a little background. Uh, this happened. It uh, went into effect on July 1. Uh, little background context on the difference between THC and uh, CBD. Uh, there's uh, well over 100 cannabinoids in uh, the plant that, depending upon the level of THC, is either uh, marijuana or hemp. What we're talking about is THC, uh, the, the psychoactive component, the part that uh, provides a high. Uh, CBD does not. Um, so there's well over 100 cannabinoids. So this is specifically talking about the THC side. And there's been the Delta-9 or the Delta-8 are the things that uh, are often associated with that high, some of the more common cannabinoids that way. If we go to the next slide, the summary of the, the state regulations provided a, uh, a lot of things. Uh, there's a restriction on a sale. Uh, you can't sell it to anybody under the age of 21. Uh, you can't mimic uh, packaging or, or labeling that looks like candy or, or food for kids. It's also not a food product, but it's edible. Um, it's regulated and overseen by the Minnesota Board of Pharmacy. Uh, so it's, it's in a unique spot at the state level on that way. You can't, uh, the packaging has labeling requirements but there's, there's limited testing and other things in the background on that way. Can't be marketed to kids. You can't take commercially available food and just add this uh, THC to it. Um, and there's a limit on the amount of THC uh, per uh, serving and package. Uh, so it can't be more than five milligrams and the package can't have more than 50 milligrams. And it has to be a, a packaged product. It can't be a, a cupcake that can be sold at a bake sale. We go to the next one. So I, I mentioned the, the Board of Pharmacy is the regulatory authority. Um, that is a, a relatively small uh, state agency. Uh, they have a complaint form uh, that is, if something's happening, you can complain and uh, they will, in theory, direct you. Um, often that's putting you to the FDA for a medical product. Um, there's an inspection checklist or a guide for local uh, jurisdictions to do inspections of the facilities. The Board of Pharmacy does not do inspections uh, or uh, on-site visits. Uh, so it's, it's really a, a complaint-based process where a lot of those complaints and concerns are put off to other parties that have the ability to do that. Under this new statute, um, it does not require that cities license THC edible retailers, um, but it also does not prohibit cities from regulating those THC edible retailers as well, right? So there's a, a spectrum of what we as a city can do from leaving state statute and the Board of Pharmacy to you know, enforce and to just follow the, the statutory requirements um, or providing additional regulation licensing requirements within the city. Um, so Bloomington staff, kind of under those parameters, held a discussion. Um, so as police, public health, environmental health, planning, licensing, legal, admin, um, and we had a discussion internally of ideally how would how would we see ourselves managing this in the city? What are the public safety, public health concerns um, that we would need might need to address in the city, um, and what would we recommend as a group to the city council for potential regulation and management of um, THC um, edible? 
products. So if we move to the next slide, uh, we came up with a, a staff recommendation to license um, edible THC retailers um, very similarly to tobacco, um, an administrative license that would be issued um, with kind of, we have what I would term as baseline um, recommendations for those regulations. And then there are additional ones that will kind of walk city council through as potential kind of add-ons, if you will, but at base minimum, we as staff um, recommend that we have uh, require placement of the edibles behind a staffed counter in establishments that are not limited to 21 plus customers, similar to to what we see for tobacco retailers, um, and you know, similar to the idea behind a licensed um, liquor establishment for off-sale liquor, right? Um, requiring minor sales compliance checks, and then a requirement for a permanent physical location, um, and regulating kiosks within those locations and pro um, prohibiting vending machines. Next slide. So we saw kind of three main benefits from those recommendations, or three three things that these did for us um, here in the city. And I'll walk you through each one, but to provide an overview, um, staff felt that th that this kind of um, administrative kind of minimum licensing requirements um, would help discourage sales and access by minors. Um, permit um, the permanent physical sales location would enhance our enforcement efforts. And then we felt this was a measured approach to regulation of a new um, product um, as it's, it's evolving um, and as laws might change. So that first one, if we can go to the next slide, discouraging sales, uh, prevention of sales to minors. Um, so there are public health and public safety concerns with sales to minors. Um, there are serious health concerns related to consumption by minors and access by minors. Um, and state law does address packaging and potency of eligibles, el el edibles and limits the sales to um, those over 21. Um, the licensing rec requirement and recommendation are an established model for helping regulate those sales of age-restricted products. It's similar to what we do for alcohol. It's similar to what we do for tobacco. Um, it provides us the opportunity to conduct compliance checks to know where these sales are taking place. Um, the requirement that unless it's a 21-plus establishment that those products be behind the counter limits the opportunities for shoplifting and access by minors, um, because we are aware that that occurs when it's just out on a shelf for anybody to grab. Um, and it also provides, you know, repeatability and consistency for our retailers. It's a setup that many of these retailers who may be looking to add THC edibles to their, um, to their products are, are familiar with, having those behind the counter or limiting access to 21 and over for their establishment. The benefit of having a, a permanent physical location kind of stems from the fact that statute does not regulate the location of THC edible sales. And so um, there is a kind of an administrative or an enforcement issue when you know we may receive a complaint. I'm, I'm concerned about the, the edibles I purchased, and the first thing you'd say is, well, where did you purchase them? And if it's, you know, oh, that vehicle that was in the parking lot the other day, it's difficult for us, and it would be difficult, right, for um, the Board of Pharmacy to, to determine who sold those products, where they came from, um, where they were purchased. And so that permanent physical location, we know where the locations of those sales are, um, and it provides um, a more effective mechanism for the city or the Board of Pharmacy to follow up on any, any complaints or concerns, because we can pinpoint where that actually was within our community. And then we believe this approach is a very measured approach. We all know THC edibles are a new, evolving product. Um, this is a very new statute. Um, and so this licensure provides us with an understanding of the number and location of retail establishments within our city. It also provides us with a clear and effective communication channel to our THC edible retailers as laws and restrictions change. Um, we have that, that mechanism to provide information to them. Um, we've also, you know, we're all in the same boat as every other city, right? We're all kind of figuring out how we react. Um, but, you know, some informal conversations and polling that we've had with other cities indicate that a lot of them are going with this kind of similar to tobacco approach 
approach um, to regulation. So an administrative license with restrictions that get to toward um, to pre uh, preventing access to minor and sales to minors. And then we have additional regulations the city council could consider. Um, and so these were pulled, we, what we did is we took a look at our alcohol and our tobacco licenses and said, okay, what else do we have in our alcohol and tobacco licenses that may, we may want to um, also apply to THC retailers? And so the intent tonight is to get council's feedback on um, staff's recommendation, and then um, if any of these potential additional regulations are of interest to council, the idea is public health will go back and do some additional um, analysis on the, the potential impacts of um, adding any of these additional regulations. Um, so and those include um, managing the age of the person who is selling the product. So in both alcohol and tobacco, you can't receive a license unless you're at least 21. And in alcohol, you have to be at least 18 to work in this establishment and sell that product. Um, there are staff training requirements in our tobacco licensure. We do not have any in our alcohol licensure. Um, distance and spacing requirements from protected uses, schools, daycares, religious institutions. Um, for alcohol, we have 300 feet from a school or a place of worship, and from tobacco, for tobacco, we do not have any. Next slide. Um, a consideration on a cap on licenses issued. Um, in alcohol, we, we don't have a cap. In tobacco, we don't issue new licenses in Bloomington, so there is effectively a, a dwindling cap, right, of the number of licenses we have for tobacco. Um, background checks, whether or not those are required, we do require them for alcohol. We do not require them for tobacco. Uh, product sampling, alcohol is allowed, and there are restrictions that are provided in state statute. Um, and in tobacco, um, sampling is prohibited. And then any signage requirements. So for alcohol, state law requires signage that speaks to the effect of alcohol consumption on pregnancy, um, the effect of um, driving while intoxicated, and I think a Surgeon General's warning about alcohol consumption in general. Um, for tobacco, we have no signage requirements within the store itself. So our next steps tonight, staff is seeking um, council direction on our, um, our recommended proposal, potential additional regulations. Um, we will then go back and provide follow-up research and information as needed to the city council to come back before you. Um, we want to, once we kind of narrow down what pieces the council may be interested um, in reviewing further, we can then um, review those through a racial equity lens. Um, once you know, I, I envision we'll probably come back one more time with some additional research and then we'll get into the stage where we can draft an ordinance amendment for council consideration, hold the public hearing, um, and provide outreach to whom we think are existing retailers, um, and then continuing, continue monitoring regulations and kind of reassess year and a half to two years out um, and ensure that our policy is doing what we believe it ought to be doing. <laughs> That that concludes the presentation. So we are available for feedback and questions and discussion. Thank you. And I'm, I'm, I know there will be feedback and questions. And, and uh, I'll, I'll start it. I think the the measured approach that you talked about is the strongest way to go. I think it's considering all the question marks out there. Um, and I think you're being very optimistic that you're going to say you're going to review our city uh, regulations in 18 months to two years. I, I can guarantee they're going to change before then because the state's going to step in and change them for us. And so I, th I think the measured approach to make sure that we, we meet some of the goals that you talked about, meet some of the objectives to, to keep it out of the hands of folks under 21, to control it in, in such a way that it's um, consistent for retailers and that it's um, uh, more manageable to do, I, I just think that makes the most sense because I can almost guarantee it's going to, it, it will change in the next legislative session as they put more guardrails up on this thing. So. Councilmember Lohman. Well, I've got a question here. Um, how many tobacco licenses do we have remaining? Uh, Mayor and Councilmember Lohman, we have 52. And then, um, you know, I like how we've laid this out. Are there, are there any requirements here that would prohibit the city from, say, for example, 
leveraging uh, this THC and um, saying, hey, you know, if you want to also do this THC, um, well, you need to give up your or sunset the uh, uh, your tobacco license. Mr. Mayor and Council Mr. Members, Council Member Lohman, I think the answer to that is probably yes, that we could do that. Uh, Legal's review is that tobacco licenses are a privilege, not a right. Uh, so if that was something that Council was interested in doing, uh, we could take a look at that. Uh, one of the things that I would suggest we'd want to look at is whether uh, it would it would function as an exclusion for other retailers in the community because uh, if we were to take an approach like that, we would probably not be able to isolate tobacco retailers or tobacco license holders uh, as the only ones who would have the privilege of a THC. Or, I mean, excuse me, we wouldn't be able to uh, have that specific policy probably for a tobacco license holder and still allow others to get a THC license. So I think, you know, if you were interested in pursuing a policy like that, you'd basically be saying that um, there's only a current group of license holders that would be uh, eligible to have a THC license moving forward. Uh, we did <clears throat> a little research about where we think THC is already being sold in the community. Uh, and I, I, I can't remember exactly the list um, to know if there were non tobacco retailers that were on that list, but I think the number is about 10 to 12 currently. Um, so uh, if there are currently um, businesses that are selling THC, it could be creating a disparate field. So, And just one other question with that. Uh, um, with that, could you do it at, as a sunset at all? Uh, so you say for the first you know, year and a half or 18 months, let's say, till we review the policy, uh, or you'd say, Hey, you know, you know, if you've got this license, you'd be eligible. Kind of give you a head start, or maybe if it's a six month start, and then we would open it up to uh, other other licenses. Or any any exclusion from doing something like that. Mr. Brugge, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Loman, uh, we'd probably have to investigate that one a little bit further. I I think um, that something like that would probably be doable, just because the the field of uh, THC policy is still relatively new. I mean, you could argue that maybe that's a way of dipping your toe into the issue um, and then looking at potentially expanding beyond that. I don't know how many might be uh, willing to just wait it out. I think one of the things we have to look at is just the economic uh, reality of, of uh, where some of our tobacco retailers get most of their profit and you know, they're, they're, them just doing the math on what makes more sense for them. Yeah, the only reason why I put that forward uh, to the rest of the council is, you know, one of our, our policy goals is to, to try to reduce some of those tobacco uh, licenses, and this may be a way both. I know this is one of the things that the uh, retailers actually had asked for is to get a little exclusive rights uh, to uh, uh, to be able to sell this. And so, you know, maybe there's some interest there uh, from the retailers. Uh, maybe not. Maybe there's interest uh, from the council from a policy perspective in terms of reducing those uh, uh, tobacco licenses. So. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and, and apologies, this one might be a little out in left field. But just anecdotally, I've got um, uh, a friend who works in banking in the Twin Cities. And they are tying themselves in knots trying to figure out how the finance of all this is going to work. And I know in places like Denver, where they've launched this, they saw huge issues with people moving large amounts of cash through communities because I didn't know that. So I, I guess, do we have any idea, are there safety concerns if we have a large amount of these businesses opening in town? Is there training or facilitation the city can provide for how to, uh, I'm assuming there's there's more capability now in the financial system that it's not all bags of cash and armored cars, but um, is that what we're looking at? Mr. Verbrugge, I don't even think there were armored cars. I think it was just bags of cash, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, council members, uh, Council Member Martin, you're correct about the the cash sale. Uh, uh, all right, so let me let me see how self revealing I want to be here. So I've been to dispensaries in other states, right? For uh, not for my own where it's legal, where it is legal, Thank not you. for my own personal use. And I know that they do operate on a cash basis simply because of the complications with um, 
you know, financial monetary rules and things like that. Um, if there are uh, training modules available for municipalities to help license holders or prospective license holders navigate some of those issues. I'm not familiar with them. We can certainly do some research and see if other states have come up with those. Um, and I, I think going back to some of the presentation here tonight and the discussion by the mayor about what's likely to happen in the next few months, uh, th you know, this is a conversation that has essentially been thrust on municipalities uh, it, very recently uh, without a lot of uh, consultation thus far. And so I think some of those ideas about um, uh, how, how best to regulate and how do you uh, help uh, inform the field within those regulations is is still evolving, frankly. That's helpful. Thanks. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so we, uh, alcohol can't be sold at gas stations. That That's in state law. Am I correct in that? Cor correct. Just three, two beer. Yeah. But, and this can't be sold in liquor stores. Yeah. So, okay. Um, I, I mean, my, I get my question there. I mean, presumably the thought behind that is that we don't want folks to buy a six pack at a gas station, crack one open and, you know, drive. And was there any discussion about the what's the word I'm looking for the um, debilitating not the right word but the the sort of the effect that I mean was there any thought around any discussion around that I concept that we don't necessarily want folks to get high and get behind the wheel Marion City Council we did discuss that as a as a public safety concern um, however we as staff found that if, if it's in the state um, and someone can, can purchase it and, and keep it in their purse um, and <laughs> carry, you know, it, it's hard for us as a city to kind of regulate for ensuring that people aren't using the product and then getting in their vehicle outside of, you know, the statutory um, uh, prohibitions against driving while impaired. Um, and so that is, that's why there isn't anything in our proposed um, licensing scheme that addresses that because kind of it's it's here um, yeah that and that that's helpful I, that was more just a general question and and that's probably something the legislature will need to look at um i guess for myself um the things that that i mean i, I think those sort of basic regulations all make sense I, I think that's a good way to approach it um in terms of the sort of the the additional list um i would be interested in in discussing age of sale like a requirement to be a certain age to sell it similar to how we approach um alcohol and tobacco i thought i guess i was incorrect i assumed the alcohol age requirement i assumed that was in state law as well that's in that's within city code there's no requirement to be a certain age within so, state law to sell alcohol well uh, mr mayor and council member coulter so it's actually under department of labor so you must be 18 or older to work in the room where alcohol is sold, wow. unless you're a busboy or playing a trumpet. Um, and um, and that's in a liquor. So again, not to be confused with, so if we do have an age requirement, again, when you walk into Cub Foods or a gas station, you might have a 16-year-old in there selling yeah. tobacco and 3-2 beer and THC. So... Um, yeah, so keep that in mind. Yeah, and I, I know that's been part of the concern with the discussion around alcohol sales at grocery stores as well. So um, so I, I think that's something we would need to discuss. Um, and then the, the only other one I would raise is the um, distance requirement from schools and, and places of worship and that kind of thing. I think that's something we should consider as well. Uh, Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, so can you just help me understand what, all of these products are because I think I think of gummies from what I've heard like CBD mm -hmm. and stuff but that isn't the only product is it I mean you I, I read something you can get drinks can you get flour can you if it's hemp with the low THC I, I don't know how that all works or what what is the whole gamut of potential products that will be sold here mayor and city council um, don't know that there's a limit to the type of product that can be infused with THC, you are correct, it could be a beverage. Um, it could be popcorn. 
um, could be candy. Um, and that's why state statute lays out these requirements that it not look like a bag of, you know, Doritos that you don't realize is also infused with THC. You know, it can't be a commercially available product packaged like a commercially available product that's then infused with THC. Um, but my understanding is there are quite a few food products that can be infused with THC, whether it be an edible or a, a beverage that you consume. Okay. Um, and then uh, from a, a sort of a, a regulatory standpoint, if we uh, take the recommendation and allow it similar to tobacco and it's in these locations and we decide later that like that's not the best way for our community to go, are those locations legally non-conforming, grandfathered in, any other, not, I mean, can we just yank that away from them in the future? Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson, it's an annual renewal process, so if the council were to change its policy uh, for licensing, uh, it doesn't seem that anybody would be able to make an ongoing claim or get grandfathered in, therefore. So then, related question, can you refresh my memory? Because wouldn't that apply to tobacco then? And if the, so if the council wanted to get rid of tobacco this year, we could just say tobacco's gone. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, Council Member Nelson, uh, my understanding is that's correct, and that was one of the, I don't know how seriously the council discussed that, but that, you know, the shock to the system for license holders, but um, yeah, is the answer. And then I think what I heard and I saw somewhere else that this, these products can't be sold in liquor stores, is that? Um, so, M Mr. Mayor and Council Member Nelson, Liquor stores are highly regulated in the state of Minnesota. In state statute, it lists exactly what they can have in there. And it's basically liquor and anything that goes in liquor. That's why you'll see olives and things like that. And then tobacco and lottery tickets. That's about it. So I read an article in some paper that one of the breweries already has a THC-infused beer. Uh, not a beer. Not, not a beer. Not okay. Maybe a ginger beer, but not an alcoholic beer. So you might see an alcoholic, or sorry, you might see a THC seltzer, but not an alcoholic seltzer. Um, and again, that's in a brewery, not a liquor store. So the on sale could, could have something like that. But again, if you go into a um, restaurant bar and they're running a vodka THC seltzer cocktail, you're, they can't do that. They can't. Okay. Sounds good. Um, okay, because I guess, you know, just comment, one of my thoughts, honestly, is this is an intoxicating substance. It's, it's not tobacco. Um, and I'm just very apprehensive about allowing it in places that aren't 21 plus. Um, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with it being available in the community and people, you know, of age that can legally buy it, buy it. But I just, you know, there's a, there's a whole different thing when you go buy alcohol at a liquor store than there is to go buy cigarettes at a gas station. I know our retailers get their compliance checks and they do great in that, you know, you know, laud them for doing a great job on those things. But for me, it's just, you know, that comfort level with the 21 plus, it's an intoxicating product. It's just, you know, it's different than drinking a Red Bull or smoking a cigarette in my mind, so. Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. It, it, that's exactly kind of along the same tracks as I was wondering about. In in states that are further along with full legalization, do they have that distinction of 21 plus behind the counter versus else? I guess with the full strength stuff, is it mostly 21 plus facilities? If that question makes sense. Thank you. Uh, you've been to the dispensaries. <laughs> Wait a minute. So, uh, Mr. Junker has fingered me as an expert in uh, other states' uh, sale of product, and I would say that is not the case. I, we'd have to do more research. Yeah. Okay, yeah. excellent. And, and I'd, I'd also be curious, uh, <laughs> as as this moves forward in crafting, and, and we had a good point, this, this rug might get pulled out from under us again with what gets implemented, but I mean, gosh, looking back to 2018, we're sitting around in study sessions looking at large-scale commercial indoor hydroponic facilities. I mean, Bloomington has the infrastructure to move quick when this thing, the floodgates open up. So to the point of stability for license holders, I would be curious what minimum viable product we could put in place that we could build on without having to then turn around and flip things on their head for people that got an early person. Anyway, if that makes sense, just... Well, I think with that in mind, uh, council members, the 
my comment earlier about the, the measured approach, I think, to, to look at that. And then to look at, uh, as we look here, you know, the review potential regulations, racial equity, provide follow-up research. I know the League of Minnesota Cities is putting together a, a model ordinance for, for cities to follow, uh, considering how it is going to change, undoubtedly going to change, considering all the questions that we have just around this in general. I mean, I would, I would hesitate to strike out on our own too far um, because of the trouble we might get in and just because it um, is going to change anyway. But I, I agree completely. I, the, it is an intoxicating substance that conceivably you could buy at Ace Hardware. I mean, you, they, they could sell it as well as long as it's behind the counter in 21 plus. So, Council Member Dallas Hondro. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. At, at the risk of going down the semantical rabbit hole of caffeine and tobacco not being intoxicating, we just have decided that they're the kind we like as opposed to the kind we don't behind a wheel of a, a car. Um, uh, so we can have that debate another time. I would, I would, I bet you Dr. Kelly could give you all kinds of really bad statistics about the effects of some of that stuff on people, right? Um, but I, but I understand, uh, I understand the the point. Um, the truth of the matter is, though, that is happening already in our community. People can go get these in Minneapolis and drive here if they want to, and we won't be prohibiting them from doing that by putting a bunch of stuff on this stuff. I also think that we're we're kind of, if I may, we're either, I think we have to decide that we're either going to sell this through retail establishments or we are going to sell them through liquor stores only is what, yeah. because- No, 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 no. I Right, I understand that we can't do that. We I understand, can't do that. right? So this is the point so, I'm so making. So we can't decide that. My 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 point. What I'm getting to is we've actually had two sides of the same argument happening here for most of the last couple of comments. We're saying it's an intoxicating subject, sub, substance, so we should regulate it like alcohol, but we can't because it's a retail substance, so we can't put it in a liquor store. That's kind of the point I'm making, is that, and we're having a conversation about sunsetting people's tobacco things, which implies that they're selling them at tobacco stores where it's not an intoxicating subject and yada, yada. So I'm just saying, like, if we could try to give you know, the, the, the team here some actual direction, I think it would be good for us to, to do that. And my point is, um, what I thought you were asking for that we haven't yet addressed is on the previous slides, there were several places where you asked, like, do you want to do this? Do you want to do this? Would it be worth it for us to go through, like we have everything else tonight, and say, direction on this, direction on this, direction on this? I think with the... Uh the staff has brought forward is to regulate this, not like alcohol. They never said alcohol, they said tobacco. So behind the counter, 21 plus to purchase. We decide on the age where they actually could sell it. And and then the, the notion, I mean, your idea of should we go through each of these? I mean, my point being, we could spend the time to go through each of these and then by early January or February, it's gonna change again on us. And uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if that's time well spent or not, so. Mr. Verbrugge, you had something to add? Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, in following up a little bit on uh, Council Member D'Alessandro's comments, there's a little bit of a yes and, too, because as Mr. Junker said, uh, you know, uh, Minnesota is this odd little state that still has 3-2 beer, and those, you know, that is officially an intoxicating liquor, and it is sold in gas stations, right? So we do have a little bit of a crossover situation there. Um, I did do a little bit of... Uh, research just with my colleagues in other cities, uh, those cities that are that we usually use as our comparable communities, the, the ones that generally are like 50,000 or more. And um, three of the cities have enacted, or I think, yes, they have enacted uh, moratoria, um, Maple Grove, Edina, and Inver Grove Heights. Maple Grove and Edina has put a 12-month moratorium in place. Inver Grove Heights has a six-month moratorium in place. The other cities, um, a couple said they're just waiting for the league's um, working group uh, to come through with recommendations. They're going to be talking about the policy, but they're not acting on it. I think they're waiting to see what the league's recommendations are. The others uh, all indicated that they are um, uh, working with their councils now to like take a, a minimal licensing approach similar to what staff has maybe suggested we do until we get more direction from the legislature. Um, the only one that really stood out to me in that comparison was one of the cities that um, indicated they will be um, licensing similar to tobacco, 
but the fee will be similar to a liquor license. And so that's a significant difference in that a liquor license in that city is more than $10,000 uh, compared to the couple hundred dollars that it is here for a tobacco license. So, th you know, that's a city that views it as being an intoxicant and uh, views the public safety issues, uh, and some of those, you know, vehicle operations and those types of things as being justifiable because, you, as you know, whenever we put a, a fee in place, State law says that we cannot use fees as revenue generators, that they are, they're supposed to be a nexus between, you know, the cost for us to provide the fee and do the associated work and then what we're charging for it. So that's one city that's looking at this a little bit differently than tobacco. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, do we have a rough idea when we can expect a model ordinance from the league? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Coulter, uh, I have another update meeting with the Municipal Legislative uh, Commission meetings, the MLC cities, which is separate from the league group, uh, in mid-September. Um, and I think they'll probably be reporting back on some of those conversations, but I don't know that they have an end target date. Okay, um, because my, I mean, part of my hesitation, I guess I should be a little closer to my... Um, I sort of at face value, I am, I would be comfortable saying let's put a minimal sort of basic level of regulation in place until we hear more from the league and or the legislature. My concern is that we don't know when that's going to be. And to be frank, I, I mean, anything that comes from the legislature is not going to come in January or February. It's, it's going to come in April, May, I mean, end of May, if, you know, if we're lucky. So I, I, my concern is if, if we wait too long on some of the substance there, and I, I'm just a little concerned about waiting too long on some of the substance, I guess. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm open to the discussion. I think a basic level of regulation is fine. Um, maybe as a way to sort of come to some kind of compromise we move forward on a sort of basic level of regulation and in six months ish three six months ish we come back and see where we're at with what the league is working on um let's see six months from now the legislature will have been in for a couple of months so we'll know a little bit more then um See, I, I guess my thought is maybe we come back at a certain point and take a look at where things are at from there and kind of make our own decisions on that. But um, I, I don't, I don't want to say let's just wait and see what the league says because we don't know when that's going to happen. Um, but I also don't want to tie our hands too much. I, I know the league is working on it, and it's a priority because everybody's having the same meeting that we're having tonight. <laughs> and... Uh, so they're, they're, I don't think it will push too far into the fall, personally. But they, they might not get uh, agreement as to what they want to say in their, their uh, model ordinance. So uh, that's just my thought. But um, Mr. Verbrugge? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Coulter. Uh, it, I appreciate your perspective that it's probably not going to happen right away at the beginning of the legislative session. Um, I, I will share with you that one of the legislators who was involved and, and met with the MLC cities indicated that there, the, the, there's a group of legislators currently working on it, consulting with public safety uh, uh, professionals, et cetera, so they can have something ready to go. And I think that legislator was optimistic that they would have something they could act on quickly just because of the urgency of um, – getting something more structured in place. So I, d I don't know if that is, <laughs> you, you probably know better than I do, but I think there's a sense that they do want to um, you know, try to get more uh, definition around this and what there is currently in place. Um, 
and I, I think that what you've asked for is is entirely reasonable. If we put a minimal structure in place, I think we'll be meeting our objectives for, um, you know, meeting those public safety and enforcement uh, standards of making sure that it's not being sold to minors and, and that we have some uh, room for monitoring and enforcement and then see how the rest of the lay of the land plays out. Thoughts on that? Council Member Nelson? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, overall, I think I could be supportive of that minimal thing. Um, I know uh, the city manager and I talked about a moratorium early on, but um, was explained to me and it was explained again tonight that, you know, we do have the ability to come in and change that later. I was just worried about a rush of people getting in and then there was, you know, very few tools for us to to do what's best for the community later. So as long as we have that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable not doing a moratorium. Um, don't think it makes a lot of sense. I, I would like to have more discussion, not necessarily tonight, but you know, as we go forward and look at that as the 21 only, um, I did happen to be able to spend uh, quite a bit of time in the Vegas area uh, a couple years ago, and you know, uh, not from personal experience, but from advertising and things like that, that they, even in Las Vegas, Sin City, it's separate. You don't buy it in liquor stores, you don't buy it in gas stations, you, don't, you have dispensaries. And that's where you buy it and it's all very 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 controlled and minnesota seems to have gone on this grand experiment of like whoo let's do this <laughs> so and to the point of council member coulter and the city manager i mean it's it's realistic that we won't even know what the legislature is doing they might not even know what they're doing so you know until after they pass it and then they're like wait what did we pass <laughs> council member d'alessandro thank you mr mayor i just want to be clear what what Places that have legalized it are selling includes full marijuana products. This is a 0.3% THC maximum product. And so it, it's it's the equivalent, in my opinion, of 3-2 beer. And I don't mean it to... to you know, to, to be disparaging of it or, or anything like that. Or, But it, but it is not... It is not the same as 151. You know, and so I think that, like... We, I don't think that we need to necessarily be as concerned be, between now and the time that the legislature is figuring this out because we they only regulate, they only authorize the sale of a very small product um, category in the plethora of products that are sell, sold in places like Washington, Colorado, and Las Vegas, and, and Nevada. So um, I don't I don't think using those as models is very helpful to us, only because it's just such a different universe of products. Um, all that being said, um, uh, I I think um, I think making sure that that we have a license in place and we have enforcement tactics in place makes a ton of sense. Um, we don't have that right now. Um, and the sooner we get something in place, the sooner we can understand the universe within which we're working. Because right now, 3,000 retailers could be selling this and we would not know. So, thank you. Council Member Lowman. So, what would it look like if, you know, for, for example, if we did a 21 plus with this product, where would you be able to sell it in the city? Um, I'm just trying to, yeah. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lowman, I'm not aware of any businesses in town that have a 21 only restriction. No. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, we have six tobacco shops. Is it? That's it. That's it. So it'd be those six tobacco shops that are right now only 21 and older, and those are the ones that are allowed to have tobacco on the sales floor, not behind the counter, because they're over 90% of their stock is tobacco and trade. So it would limit us down to the six licensed tobacco spots. So then beyond that, then you'd have to just... You'd Until they open up liquor stores, that's it. Yep. So otherwise, so if, if we did put the requirement on, you know, for 21 plus, that would be it. You'd only be able to sell it in those six... Those six locations. Yeah. Uh, Mayor and Council, or if another business opens that just solely sells these products and limits it to 21 plus. Um, so it, it wouldn't necessarily just be tobacco... Read tobacco stores. I mean, if I chose to open up Christina's edible shop and that was my only product and I limited it to 21 plus customers, right, that would meet that same definition. I don't know that we'd have any of those in the city, but that would potentially be a possibility. And we might. We wanted to find that in the code that way because that's how we defined a tobacco shop. So again, we could mimic our tobacco code to say if you're a 90% or better THC shop, 
then you're adult only, nobody under 21 allowed in. So something that, that's another point that you could put in and create a, a new thing. Council Member Nelson? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. I'll be brief because that, that was going to be my question too, or my point is you could, you know, people can open a business still, so we could do that. And that's sort of what I was getting at in, in one of my first questions about how wide the variety of different products are. I mean, would there be a viable business or is it just really one product that you'd sell? But I mean, if there are multiple different things that you could do, I mean, I could see it being a viable business. And, you know, if it was 21 plus, you know, it, that would be a lot more comfortable than trying to put, uh, you know, popcorn and beverages and gummies and everything behind the counter at a gas station or at uh, the grocery store or wherever. So. So, Council, where are we at here? Um, <laughs> yeah, waiting for the state. You're right. Council Member D'Alessandro. Yeah, I think that, um, seriously, can we get that quick list back up? Because there was something else that was on there that I did want us to actually talk about very briefly. So, I, could you back it up to the list of uh, condition? There we go. Thank you. Were you looking for the additional regulations or the This basic one, and then there was a, another one, right? There we go. Thank you. Oh, yes. No sampling. That's a bad idea. Okay. Just want to throw that out there. Yeah. <laughs> I would agree with that. Yes. I knew there was one we could just get to. <laughs> <laughs> so, council staff has. Uh, recommended moving forward, this, putting this together similar to tobacco. Um, if we want to add some of those additional uh, regulations, we could certainly do that. Or, I mean, we've, we've kicked around different possibilities as to how to regulate it more or how to regulate it less, to be honest. And um, I, think the, I think the only thing off the table right now are sampling and a moratorium. I don't know that we want to go that far with anything. Um, but there's got to be something in between, I would think. Councilmember Coulter? Well, thank you, Mayor. I'm going to, I guess, I, it's not like a motion that I'm going to renew, but I'm just going to suggest again that we move forward with this sort of um, minimal, we'll call it minimal, um, licensing and enforcement structure as staff has laid out. I think, you know, I raised some issues and some other folks have as well. I think those are good and important. I think we need a more fulsome discussion of those issues and a more, to the extent that it's possible with this issue, a more informed discussion of those kinds of things. Um, and so I, I think, you know, to, to Council Member D'Alessandro's point, I think we should get something, we can get something on the books, not now, but as soon as, as ASAP as possible. and then come back to my suggestion would be that we come back to those issues and further refine that ideally with input from the league of minnesota cities uh, potentially something from the legislature after, you know within a few months of the legislative session but that's gonna that's the suggestion i'm gonna make and, and i would agree with that council member and i think just realistically in the time it will take to put something together notice a public hearing bring back a public hearing i mean we could have a sample ordinance from the league of cities by then i mean just in the time that that's going to take um, so, I, I mean, I think that makes good sense, a, a basic kind of groundwork that we can work with that could be added to, subtracted to, and we have a further discussion as, as this kind of evolves. Because I think also it's possible that, uh, it's possible, once the legislative session starts, that this door that is cracked open gets kicked wide open, and then we have, then, then, we, then we're similar to Vegas and, and, and Colorado and everybody else. So. I don't think that's out of the question. So, Ms. Mandershed. So what I'm hearing, I just want to provide some specific direction to staff, is what I'm hearing, checking in here, no sampling, no sales to under 21, and sales behind the counter. I, I think those are things we can all agree on. Our product behind and the license. counter, I should say. And, and, I think, and I think licensing. Oh, yes. And yes, licensing, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. And defining a 21, a 21 only shop, put similar to what we have in tobacco. If they're 90% or more THC, then it's a 21 and older. I, I think that makes sense as okay. well. If if, mm -hmm. if that isn't, I mean, if you can just copy the, yeah, the just tobacco shop, copy that over, define yeah. that over. I, as, as, again, I wouldn't put 
a whole lot into it because it's going to... Uh, uh, Peter's going to do it. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we're good. <laughs> so. And Mayor and Council, we had a little bit of discussion about the age of the person selling the product. Would we want to mirror alcohol and tobacco and limit that to... You can't receive a license if you're under 21 or sell the product if you're under 21. I mean, I always... As an 18-year-old, you're an adult, for goodness sake, I think. But, I mean, that, that's just my thought. I don't know that we limit the sales to 21, I think. Okay. I, I, that's just me. A, you have to be 18 to sell the product? 18 so to sell, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Enough to work with there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, good. Thank you. And, and thanks, Council, for the discussion. And I think there's a, you're, you're all right. There's, there's a lot more to discuss here, and this is... Uh, a lot more to go, and and as I said, I'm I'm not kidding. The this discussion has happened in every council chambers across the state of Minnesota, uh, or will be very shortly. So, thank you for that. Our final item on the agenda this evening is uh, item 5.5, .5, our city council policy and issue update. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, I'm sure that others are going to say this as well, but let me just say thank you to everybody who helped in planning and coordinating uh, Bloomington Pride over this weekend. Very successful event. One of the things I spe specifically want to address is a, a comment that I've heard frequently from uh, people in the community who were uh, maybe opposed to the event is this notion of spending taxpayer dollars on the event. Um, in terms of the budget for uh, Bloomington Pride, I, I think uh, it is likely going to uh, not include any city of Bloomington tax dollars because the support from corporate and community sponsors for the event was so strong and then additional money that was, uh, or revenue was generated from sale of things. Um, there may be a little bit, but if there is, it's not gonna be much. Um, and I would say that's even not even the point um, because we do a lot of other community events around here that uh, we make a decision about whether we're going to support uh, with with city dollars or not. Um, I would point out that uh, the uh, Heritage Days celebration a few years ago, we were subsidizing to the tune of about $40,000 a year for the last couple of years. So, uh, you know, the city supports events in the community that are open to all. This event was open to everybody in the community, and that's what we try to do is uh, make sure that we have events that are welcoming and uh, inclusive, and I would put Bloomington Pride in that category. So I appreciate the work that everybody did, and uh, I had a really nice event this weekend. And I would echo that. I thought it was a, a great event. Uh, it was great to see so many members of the community out, and um, it was just a great feel to it. And it was uh, very enjoyable. And to Mr. Verbrugge's point, the the questions about taxpayer dollars in general, but taxpayer dollars specifically sent, spent for a specific group of people, this was, this was open to everybody. This was absolutely open to everybody. And we do a number of different things where we use our, our dollars to, to uh, uh, highlight or celebrate a group of people. Our Veterans Day celebration that we do every year is specifically for veterans. It's open to everybody. And, uh, and I encourage folks to join us. It's at Northwestern Health Sciences every year, and it's a great event, absolutely fantastic event. Uh, and that's just an example of, of that type of thing where we, we laud a certain group and invite the entire community to come along. And I think it's... Uh, it, it's absolutely uh, applicable here and absolutely something that we need to continue to do. And uh, absolutely, if we get the opportunity, expand that as well, because I think it's a, it's a, great, it's a great model to follow. Um, I want to review what we, we heard in our listening session tonight. Uh, so folks who are watching at home actually have the, the full rundown. We heard from actually an interesting group of folks tonight. I, th I thought very interesting group. Uh, Don Heinzman, uh, a local retired journalist who I'm sure everybody knows Don, and Jean Belfile, who is at the, uh, the, the Bloomington Historical Society, came forward, and they have put together a group of 100 notable Bloomington residents and written up, um, written up profiles of 100 Bloomington notable residents. Uh, from the arts, from politics, from community leadership, professional and Olympic athletes. And it's actually 
what they described to us was very interesting, I thought, and they would like to bring it forward and uh, present it to the city council formally, and we said, absolutely, we would love to have you, so be on the lookout for that. That's going to come up in, in uh, the very near future here on a city council uh, agenda. We heard from um, uh, Sally Ness, who had questions about a conditional use permit that was issued 12 years ago and how it applies and whether or not different parts of that conditional use permit are being met or not met this, uh, at this time. We heard from uh, Marshall LaValle, who talked specifically about issues with fiber optic and high-speed internet connections, and uh, I think there was everybody in the everybody in the room was nodding in agreement that yes, the the fiber optic, the high-speed internet connections, not the 5G, the actual high-speed connections, are an issue here in Bloomington, and we're looking for options and different ways that we can improve on those and improve the coverage across the city of Bloomington. And Mr. Verbrugge brought up the fact that uh, Hennepin County. Uh, is looking at grants to reduce the digital divide. Don't know that that affects this specifically, but it all kind of rolls together and it's an in interesting discussion uh, that I hope we can continue. And then we also heard from um, uh, Darwin Schafferling and Tara, and I didn't write down Tara's last name as she, as she spoke to us, who spoke on this issue of THC that we were spoken, speaking about just recently. Uh, and she is uh, battling cancer right now and she's talked about the, the benefits of THC in um, in her in her journey with uh, stage four cancer, and so uh, interesting perspective. Talked with uh, those folks and as well as others that this was a, a a study session type discussion that we had tonight. But ultimately, as we continue this discussion, as it becomes uh, an, a draft ordinance, there will be a, a public hearing where everybody's going to be able to come forward and talk about their experiences, their thoughts, their. Uh, ideas as it relates to them specifically and as it relates to the city of Bloomington. So looking forward to that in the very near future. Council, anything to add? Council Member Martin and then Council Member Coulter. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, just real briefly, uh, so I have been serving on the Heritage Days board as kind of a liaison between um, the, the city and that organization and very excited if folks haven't heard yet uh, that the parade is coming back uh, Saturday, September 17th at 10.30. Uh, awesome opportunity after hiatus due to the pandemic uh, to kind of get the community together and celebrate uh, a lot of different organizations. Uh, I will put in a quick plug at uh, bloomingtonheritagedays.org. Uh, I think we're about a third of the way overall to volunteers for things like setup, cleanup, things like that. Uh, so if you're looking to enjoy a great parade uh, and a great organization, I would encourage you to sign up and volunteer. It would be appreciated. Couldn't agree more. It's, a, it's actually a fun organization to be part of. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I First of all, I want to echo the comments with regards to Bloomington Pride. It was just a ton of fun. Um, I'm glad so many of so many of our, our neighbors were there, and it, it really was just a wonderful event. Um, but the issue that I wanted to raise was something that we had, I, I think a few council members had raised as, as um, a priority for this year, and I recognize with where we are at, with the calendar and the work we have ahead of us, um, but that is the issue of wage theft and taking local action to address that. And um, this issue has some urgency. I recently had a meeting with um, some folks with, with Lyuna, the labor, Laborers Union, uh, who referenced specific developers who are working in Bloomington and specific a specific project in Bloomington um, that there have been concerns raised uh, with regards to wage theft. Um, and there are actions that are more appropriately taken at the local level rather than at the state level um, that I, I think would be of interest to this council and, and I think would be in the interest of our community to move forward with. Um, and so I, I, we don't have to have a full here and now discussion um, but I am, you know, this was, as I mentioned, raised by a few people, myself included, at the beginning of this year as something we wanted to move forward on in terms of labor standards and, and wage theft. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if there is interest in the council, uh, within the council on doing that um, and what that might look like in terms of timing and, and all of that as far as staff. First step, I guess, looking down the dais here, if there's enough nodding heads that we want to move forward on something like this. And then I'm going to look the other direction and ask if we have the staff capacity and the fact that we're in mid-August uh, of the year already. And I know that work plans are already set. So uh, is it something that would be feasible to look at between now and, and the end of the year? 
Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I would I would first of all say that we aren't doing anything actively working on uh, wage theft as a policy. Um, and we have two positions that we're in the process of recruiting for, uh, compliance-related positions that were uh, approved uh, following the earn sick and safe leave policy being adopted. They'll also be working on um, conversion therapy policy uh, to some extent. Um, so we would have to add that into the job description for the compliance manager if that is uh, a direction that council ultimately went to. Um, but I would say uh, we would probably need some more direction from uh, council on what it is that you would uh, like us to do uh, moving in that direction. Again, laying out uh, you know what the engagement expectations are uh, and what process you would like to use if, if council wants to move forward. Uh, I didn't directly answer the question of bandwidth. I would say that um, bandwidth is, is uh, very tight right now. So perhaps we could uh, maybe on a, on a next study session maybe have a discussion as to what we're, you know, to, to define the issue a little bit more, define what possible actions we might want to take, and, and define what work it would take to address the issue that we're talking about. Would, would that be acceptable? Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I think it would be helpful just to have a sense, uh, Council Member Coulter, your comment about some actions that are mo more appropriately taken at the local level uh, or that are possible at the local level. So understanding what some of those things are would be helpful. Does Member Loman a question? Yeah, I, I know as a part of that discussion, maybe it doesn't fit or maybe it does fit. I know that uh, there's a number of us who also talked about uh, minimum wage. Um, so I don't know if that is something we'd want to uh, dovetail in with that, um, but uh, I do know that a number of us talked about that as well. And and I, do, I don't know how well it dovetails in. I think it's, pretty, it's a separate issue in a lot of different ways. Um, and it's, it's the same questions that I brought, I mean, on this. Do we have the, the bandwidth? It's, it's mid-August already. Do we have the bandwidth to, to try and tackle this before the end of the year, or do we talk about it as a potential for, you know, for next year? We just to con consider it, because we saw the, uh, we saw the, uh, the work plans for all the different departments as we as we started this year and um, We just have to make sure that we don't Put our staff over the edge with all of these different things that we bring at them in in August of the year I guess my point is there's a lot of things on that list that uh, we maybe haven't addressed so um, well, Again, there's a lot of things on the list, but uh, there was also a lot of things on the work plans yeah. Already. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, is that you know, since we have that long list, maybe it makes, maybe it's more appropriate to look at all of the items there and determine if there is, if there is some bandwidth that's uh, available. What is the top priority to, to kind of work through? Just, just another, uh, just another perspective. Council, anything additional? Seeing nothing, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. We are adjourned on a 6-0 vote. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks to the staff for your work this evening. Thanks much. Thanks to the council for some good conversation. Well done. Everybody have